opening of the first European Congress on Disinformation and Fact Checking. I am very pleased to introduce the guests that will welcome all of us to this Congress. Let's have a look to the guests that will give this welcome message to all of us. The first welcoming message will be provided by Conchi Cascajosa. She is the director of the Department of Communication and Media Studies at University Carlos III of Madrid. Uh, Conchi, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Thank you uh, so much to the organizing uh, committee of this uh, wonderful uh, conference. I'm, I'm really proud of having, you know, this uh, activity taking place at our uh, department in this uh, hybrid uh, uh, form. Um, because I think one of the, you know, we know that uh, disinformation and fake news is one of the biggest threats that we know nowadays in you know in democracies and we are and in, in the case of our department we are uh, particularly proud of having this uh, joint venture between the research uh, group uh, uc3 media lab and stop fake uh, led by uh, victoria romaniuk who at the time is uh, visiting the professor our, our uh, department um, I think that uh, in some occasions we had the, the opportunity to, to defend uh, democracy. Uh, sometimes it's, a, it's an effort and particularly I want to, to, to give an explicit uh, support to our colleagues uh, from Ukraine. Uh, and you know, led by Victoria and other uh, other colleagues from Stofek, uh, because they have been working tireless uh, to protect uh, the country not only from you know an invasion from from Russia, but also from other types of invasions, and particularly in the field of uh, of uh, uh, communication, the the dissemination of fake news about uh, what was happening in in Ukraine during during this uh, invasion. So I'm really proud that the uh, Carlos III University and our department, as part of the different activities we are, you know, developing uh, regarding uh, fake news and different formation, we are part of this uh, uh, joint uh, research uh, project. And um, that uh, probably your conclusions will be very illuminated for, for us as uh, lecturers, as a department of uh, communication for, for our student, but also uh, I'm really hoping that the conclusions of the conference will be useful for the, you know, for the, for other, you know, uh, media, for, you know, for other uh, uh, journalists, and also for the, you know, for public institutions, uh, to take into co into consideration, you know, the, the real threat that the uh, disinformation and, and fake news are uh, right now for you know for the democracy. Mm -hmm. So all the best for these uh, two days of uh, hard work in this tomorrow. I think it will be face-to-face uh, -face, uh, activities at the Puerta de, uh, de Toledo and. Good luck for the, the you know for the activities that are, they are going to take place during this uh, joint research project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Conchi, for your welcoming message. We very much appreciate that. And now we would like to continue with this opening session, and I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Bernardo Grassa. He is program manager of the European Media and Information Fund and he's also representing in this Congress, the EMIF. So Bernardo, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, uh, let me first just um, tell you how pleased I am to be here um, at the Congress and also to um, see that EMIF is able to give uh, resources to, to this project and to many other projects that are fighting very important um, threats. And um, I would like also to uh, give uh, a, a special a special thank you to Mark Marginedas, which we will have the pleasure to, to hear 
um, in very, very shortly and um, and say hello to all the other speakers and and attendees. The, these these gatherings are extremely important, um, as you know. Uh, I just came from uh, and Danielle had the pleasure to be there as well. I just came from Florence from our AMIF uh, annual event. And it was also a fantastic opportunity to to build synergies and to build uh, relations between entities. And uh, this project is also a, a, a great um, show that uh, to, be, to bring different stakeholders together can really create um, uh, co can co can create a solid um, projects and can bring uh, problems from very different realities uh, to the table to the same table. Um, Emif is very glad um, to to have provided uh, the resources to to make some of this uh, work and um, and yeah um, I'm very lucky to be here. I'm just hoping to enjoy your Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bernardo. And also thank you, of course, to the European Media and Information Fund because it's our uh, supporter, our funder for this uh, Congress. So we very much appreciate that. And now we would like to continue with these welcome messages. And I have the pleasure to introduce my colleague in the organizing committee of this Congress, Victoria Romaniuk. She is the Congress coordinator and she is here representing StopFake, the leading fact-checking agency in Ukraine. So, Victoria, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Daniel. It, it is a great honor to welcome the participants of our Congress. A year ago, when the war in Ukraine began, we were not only witnessing brutal and violent event, but the war was also unholding in information space. When we decided to launch a project that would explore disinformation as a global threat for democracy, values, and humanity, today, a year after we absolutely understand that uh, the crisis is not over and the war and information threat are regained in the world. Russia disinformation has changed its approach and uh, the new goal is increasing global crisis, doubts and contradictions in society. Uh, it is a new goal of propaganda and disinformation, as well as digital technology, social media and changes in user behavior is a very important topic uh, uh, and to be uh, in-depth uh, research. Ukraine's lessons are very important in this context because for the ninth year we try to understand and analyze Russian disinformation as well as try to explain and communicate with different target audience about the main threats of Russian disinformation. And I'm really very happy that our relevant idea have been implemented in such a great international congress uh, we managed to bring together journalists, uh, fact checkers, and researchers from different countries. And I want to say thank you very much, Conchi and Daniel, and universities that was uh, open to progressive idea and contributed to implementation of this project. And I would I would like to say thank you for all participants because I'm absolutely sure that uh, this event is just one step before the new a large uh, project. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria. Uh, we very much appreciate this partnership, this collaboration between the University Carlo III of Madrid and the research group UC3M Media Lab and StopFake. So we look forward for our future collaboration. And, and now, just to, to close this opening session, I would like to share some few slides uh, with you. Let, give me a couple of seconds, please. <clears throat> yeah, here it is. OK, so I would like to give you some uh, numbers of this event that we are starting today. 
As I mentioned before, this event is co-organized by the research group in C3M Media Lab at the University Carlo III of Madrid and the Department of Communication and Media Studies. And we are organizing this Congress together with the Stop Fake, which is the leading fact-checking agency in Ukraine. And we are supported by the European Media and Information Fund, which is managed by the Kalauste Gulbenkian Foundation in Portugal. And just to give you some uh, key facts of this Congress, we have received 251 registrations. This is a hybrid Congress. In total, from all registrations we have, 27% will be involved actively in the different sessions. So they will be speakers during this Congress. We're very proud to announce that this Congress will be attended by colleagues from many different parts of the world. We were focusing in Europe. That's why this is the European Congress on this information and fact checking. But we are very glad that we also received attention and participation from colleagues from other parts of the world. So we are 38 countries. The, the, the most uh, 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 participating country is Spain, followed by Belgium, Ukraine, Germany, France, United Kingdom, United States, and Portugal. And these are the countries that are represented in this Congress. So we are very glad to see that even though our focus was in Europe, we have received participation and speakers from different parts of the world. And as it was mentioned by Victoria already, we are also very glad to see that this event is a place where different stakeholders in the field of disinformation and fact-checking are coming together in order to share experiences and look into the future together. So we can see that the majority of participants come from the university sector, but we are together with some other colleagues working in public organizations, in governmental institutions, in private companies, also freelance journalists, NGOs, fact checkers, and the media. So these are the affiliations that we have and that we will be together during these two days. And we are also very pleased to announce and to launch this book that we have published today, uh, thanks to the European Media and Information Fund. And in this book, we have 33 authors participating all together, writing 23 chapters in more than 400 pages. And here we have different perspectives, guidelines, recommendations on disinformation and fact checking. The book is open, is freely accessed by this link that you have in the slide. In the Congress program website, you will find the link to this book. So we are very thankful to all authors, to all experts, who participated in this work. Thank you so much. And now that we are coming to the end of this uh, welcome uh, session, I would like to say thank you uh, to Conchi, Bernardo, and Victoria for your welcome messages. And I think that now we are ready to start with the opening keynote that will be done by Mark Marginedas and Matteo Pugliese. First, we are having the keynote of Mark Marginedas. He's a senior reporter working for the international desk of El Periódico, a daily newspaper from Barcelona. As an expert in the former Soviet Union and the Middle East, he has spent 11 years of his life working in Moscow as the newspaper's correspondent in two periods back in the 90s and then from 1998 until 2002. 
and more recently from 2015 until 2022. He has reported about Putin's rise to power, the Second Chechen War, and the Syrian civil war and the invasion of Ukraine. He has traveled extensively throughout North Africa and the Middle East, as well during the years he worked as the publication's war correspondent. In 2013, he was kidnapped by ISIS, the jihadist group in Syria. He graduated in communication sciences at the University of Navarra in 1990 and got a postgraduate diploma in international relations at the University of Amsterdam. Apart from his two native tongues, Catalan and Spanish, Mr. Mark Ginedas speaks fluently English, French, and Russian, and also he can have a decent conversation in Arabic. So Mark, you have the floor. Mark, you should unmute your microphone. Uh, thank you so much. It's a real honor. I want to thank particularly Daniel and Jeff Hefenchenko and Victoria for uh, for uh, inviting me to participate in this in this impo very important congress. I am extremely grateful to the Carlos Cal University for organizing so something which is uh, basically and you know something probably I would say one of the major problems that you know the world and international society is facing at the moment. No, as a correspondent in Moscow for 11 years. I've seen so many times how uh, Russian narratives and how Russian fake news have uh, um, arrived and have uh, have but really influenced deeply, deeply, deeply over our over, um, over, over, over media space. No, I just would like to uh, to put an, uh, one of the, the major examples, for instance, of the successes of the of of the, of Russian of Russian deprivation is probably the use of chemical weapons in Syria. Probably, if we um, a country as uh, that Daniel said, uh, I was kid uh, where I was kidnapped in Syria. The uh, you know, uh, if we go to the street uh, and we ask to anybody uh, who was using chemical weapons in Syria, we would say we don't know, we know we know nothing. And um, and what, what what happened? I mean, we know that the reality that more than ninety five percent of the chemical uh, attacks in Syria were carried out by the Syrian regime, the ally of Moscow. And uh, but unfortunately, um, Russia was very good in disinforming, in uh, in, in in giving alternative views that uh, provoke this this mobilization in society uh, of something which is atrocious which is the use of uh weapons of mass destruction uh against civilian targets so i will start i mean for me russian deformation is a presented challenge for uh our democracies and for um for our um, and, uh, and uh, for the cohesion of society it goes far beyond the, uh, the, the I mean, normally pr pr uh, all countries that are engaged in wars, like nowadays, like Russia since the arrival of Putin, they engage in propaganda. Propaganda basically means you undermine, you minimize the losses of your of your enemy, uh, you minimize your, loss, minimize your losses and you maximize the loss of your enemy. You try to get false data. But, you know, Russian disinformation, it goes far, far beyond um far far beyond and he's able to um to actually uh to well to modify the state of our public opinions i would invite you to now russia obviously everybody knows that the main uh that the main t the main element in the main tool in this information is rt right uh, uh former russian tv uh, uh, uh from russia today and uh, but now it is banned in most of the European countries. And um, but and nevertheless, that doesn't mean that they are not giving up their efforts in in, in in widespread propaganda. I want to invite you to see this short video of Margarita Simonian. It's in Russian, but after the uh, video, I will tell you exactly what she's saying. And I think it's very it really uh, it's a, a clear example of how I mean of how Russia is operating now that the war has started and Russia today has been banned. Here you are. Uh, Mark, sorry, you need to share your screen. Sorry? You need to share your screen. 
We don't see your screen. Sorry. I mean, to share, compartir tu pantalla. Yeah, we don't see how, your uh, screen now. One second. Uh, hold again. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, compartir, compartir pantalla. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, yes, and one second. This is okay. Yes. I'll compartir. Para pantallas, yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, now you can see that. And then I open yes, now. You need to open your PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Okay, yes. Yes, this is the one. And click on the third. Vista de presentación. There? Go down, down to the to the right. Abajo a la derecha. Yeah. Ahí, ahí, ahí. Abajo a la derecha, Mark. Ahí, yes, ahí. Here? Sí. Okay, so here you are. Yes. Okay, so I mean, basically, this this video is very important because basically it's a it's a video by Margarita Simonian, which is the news editor of RT. She says uh, that after the ban of uh, of of RT, she's working under the regime of partisan troops. And then the interview in the interviewer conductor says, "What does it mean?" As it said, "This is I cannot say that it's a secret." But then further on, she boasts she boasts about the fact that um, that she can actually change the mood in Germany, and that the, you know more people are in Germany are supporting uh, the uh, what what she calls the special uh, operation, which is the invasion of Ukraine in in in. In, in in Germany, I think this is a very it's a very meaningful uh, meaningful uh, statement because what is you know partisan troops? I mean partisan troops in during the Soviet Union uh, during the war between the Nazis and the Soviet Union in the in the in the um, you know in Germany and other and, other, and the occupied Soviet Union there were partisans working. So we probably have um, uh, we probably have partisans working here as well. So. Um, what do we i mean who do we know who is one second who is nowadays who can be a candidate of a partisan or of a partisan a member of this partisan troop in uh, in, in 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 spain well we have somebody who was used to be a propagandist um uh okay uh one second uh, uh, her name is Ina Finogenova. Ina Finogenova, uh, she was all the time, I mean, before, uh, she has the, been the deputy editor of her T webpage in Spanish, at least since 2016. Um, she, um, she was, um, well, uh, uh, just after her tea was banned in the EU, she publicly resigned, claiming that she does not agree with the war. And got hired by Pablo Iglesias, by Pablo Iglesias here, and participated first in La Base, and then uh, became a, the main a main figure, one of the main sort of um, one of the main um, one of the main communicators in our team. One question I want to say as a disclaimer: I'm not using the the word agent. I'm not using the word agent with anybody of the people who are going to mention. I'm just calling the propagandists. Why I'm calling the propagandists and not journalists? Because it has been proven that they have defended pro-Russian narratives in the past, and uh, and it has been proven as well that they have broadcast the uh, uh, fake news and they never retracted. So for me, people like them, they don't fall into the category of uh, journalists. They are propagandists, and that, that can be stated. Well, we can we have here uh, Finogenova being a propagandist, one of the um, 
in one of the uh, emissions of Ailes Ba, which is uh, uh, which is a very you know uh, uh, when she was she was commenting the main news uh, every week, and uh, that was when that was particularly when during the constitutional crisis in Catalon with the constitutional crisis in Catalonia, uh, uh, the, the 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 problem with, with, between the independent the pro-independence movement and the government. Um, she obviously, well, she plays with the with the Spanish uh, map and uh, separates uh, Catalonia from the rest. So now we have uh, Ina Finogenova in Lovace. She was hired by 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 them. She in the first um, emission of uh, in Lovace, she was interviewed by Pablo Iglesias and by the uh, deputy by the editor of um, of, of Publico. And basically, she said, "Yes, I resigned because I cannot mention the world, the world world anymore." But she never, never uh, apologized for what she did, for um, the fake news that in the past uh, RT might have uh, broadcast, particularly, for instance, um, news related to the uh, to the downing of uh, MH MH17, uh, the uh, the Malaysian Airlines plane that was downed by by Russian battery. Uh, that was a position, a position in occupied Ukraine. In Afinogenova, I mean, the good thing about about Russian propaganda is that we can actually find it's very easy to find contradictions. Uh, RT is a tool, and RT in English, for instance, is a very progressive, very anti, very uh, probably xenophobic. But RT in Spanish is um, is leftist, and because it, it actually adjusts its message. To uh, its audience, so that happens exactly the same with the ma with the main figure. Ina Finogenova is a woman is a woman a woman of contradictions. Well, she says now in Spain that she's a pacifist, but while she worked in in RT, in an interview with Cuba de Debate, uh, uh, a Cuban outlet, she called Chechen rebel terrorists. Why this the use of this vocabulary is very important because. Um, uh, the time when Putin launched the first, the second Chechen war, it was not called. I mean, like in the war in Ukraine, it was never called. It was never used the word war. It was called anti -op anti terrorist operation. So basically, uh, using this word, um, she um, assumes all uh, the narrative of of, of of the of the Russian regime. Even though, I mean, uh, we have to remember that in the in the in the in the Chechen conflict in the between the first and the second Chechen war. Uh, between two, 150,000 people and 200,000 people were killed out of a population of one, one, a million and a half. So that means probably more than 10% of the population. Uh, still, I mean, for that woman, um, this war uh, was, was carried out by terrorists. But now she claims that in, in Spain that she's a pacifist. We uh, keep on have, have finding many contradictions as well. I mean, amongst the many contradictions that, are, that you know, struck me when I research and we wrote a series of articles on her uh, um, that was the fact that I mean now she in Spain she works for Canal Red which is a media close to Podemo the fast the, the far left party headed by Yonevelarra and Pablo Iglesias but we know that she was the deputy editor of um, of, RT, of the Spanish web page of RT from 2016 that means that all internal content you know uh, goes under her, her supervision and, uh, and she um, and, and 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 she needs to give her green light. Well, she gives the green light to news like this: mitos y verdades sobre la ilusa de las ofertadas. It means, I mean, the headline is myths and and and, and real things about the Russian law of uh, of slapping in the face. What's the the Russian law of slapping in the face? It was a proposal uh, that was that was approved by the Duma, that the state Duma, that actually uh, reduced and practically uh, legalized uh, family violence if it happens only once per, per year and there is no blood or um, any sort of broken um, broken bones involved. So, in I mean, in that, uh, in this writing this uh, this news piece and writing particularly the headline. It means that she is actually uh, undermining, or kind of su not supporting, but at least undermining uh, or, or um, you know, patronizing with, the, with 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 something which is so important for Podemos, which is uh, which is family uh, violence. Sorry, Mark, we have one minute. 
Yes, okay. Um, the last thing that I'm going to say is that she she's not what she does in Spain. She criticizes the repression in Russia, but at the same time, uh, I mean, but that's something that she didn't do when she was uh, in uh, the deputy of RT. She never said anything about the poisoning of uh, opposition leaders, and when in, in RT, she never denounced down against Russian opposition leaders. So we have, I mean, and she, this is who has 300,000 uh, um, followers, and she's popular in Latin America. And I believe that we have followers, uh, people attending this conference in Latin America. We have other people, we have Russian propagandists in Spain, uh, who have, who target different sectors of the political spectrum. We have Ruben Gilbert. He basically wants to question you know, democracy and could question the elections and question the credibility of uh, Spanish democracy. We have Pedro Baños, who somebody, for instance, who said that, uh, who claimed that the Russian, uh, the, the Malaysian airplane was uh, down. There were alternative versions and it was, it might be not true that it was down by a uh, Russian battery. And we have Lucy Vaya, whose uh, uh, audience is basically far, far, um, Far right, it's a far right. One of, my, one of the most important, one interesting things is that Lucy Bayer used to work for a used to work for a for a TV station, Seven NN, that this has now now has been closed, but is using exactly the same frequency of Canal Red from Pablo Iglesias. I'm going to leave it like this, and I hope I, I'm, I'm good in time and open for your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mark for your great uh, presentation and sharing your experience with all of us. And if there is any question, we will have, uh, after the next uh, session, we will have uh, some a minute for questions and answers. So you can keep your questions with you and we will have them in the future. But now we need to move forward with the next keynote. And uh, we have our speaker, Matteo Pugliese who is completing his PhD in political science at the University of Barcelona. Uh, his work on the presence of Russian propaganda on Italian media was cited by Foreign Policy and The Guardian. Since 2017, he has been studying topics of international security and hybrid threats. Pugliese is a reserve officer of the Italian Carabinieri Police and served in the general commander staff dealing with international cooperation and counter terrorism issues. So, Matteo, you have uh, the floor. Mateo got some few uh, technical problems and he just told me that he will join again from another uh, uh, browser. So he will come soon. Mateo, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, sorry for this technical problem. Uh, as uh, as you said, I'm, I'm glad to be here uh, in presence in uh, in Madrid and to meet you all tomorrow in person and uh, thanks for uh, the invitation. Uh, my uh, contribution will focus on the situation uh, in Italy but it's of course connected to the rest uh, of Europe in terms of uh, dynamics and strategy. So I'd like to share my presentation to uh, yeah here I'm trying to share the presentation, but apparently it doesn't work. Don't worry, Matteo, we can ask our technical secretary to share the presentation for you, if you don't mind.
Let me try this way. I'm uploading it as a file. Can you maybe? Uh, don't worry, Matteo. We can ask because about you know I can't it. hear you now. Um, so we can ask our Tenka Secretaria to share the presentation, please. Miguel, can you please share the presentation of Matteo Pugliese? Right. Okay, thank you. So perfect. So um so in my view, Russian disinformation can be interpreted as an integral part of the hybrid strategy of information warfare and not simply as a means of political propaganda. It is, in fact, a military tool with specific objectives for two reasons. First, Russian disinformation is often elaborated and disseminated by institutions such as the Russian Ministry of Defense, the Military Intelligence, GRU, or the FSB. Second, the disinformation produced by these entities is aimed at achieving military goals such as uh, stopping the flow of weapons to Ukraine as well as weakening the morale and convincing the defenders to surrender. This goal is pursued by manipulating the Western public opinion to pressure governments and parties to change the political agenda and international alliances. It is no coincidence that already in 2012, as uh, you already saw in the video before of Margarita Simonian, she was the editor of a, a, a RT, she compared her TV network to the Russian Defense Ministry. Okay, we can stay on this slide. Um, so Italy showed uh, little antibodies to defend itself against the aggressive disinformation campaign uh, of Russian propaganda. Several reasons contributed uh, to this fragility. Uh, in April 2022, according to an opinion poll, 48, 46% of Italians believed that information about the invasion of Ukraine was uh, manipulated and distorted by pro-Ukraine media, while 25% thought that the photos of massacres were fake or altered to the, the legitimize Putin and Russia. Among the causes of the Italian public disorientation are also, in my view, functional illiteracy which is close to 28%, and digital illiteracy. Uh, these data uh, demonstrate that the Italian audience constitutes a, a fertile ground for manipulation through propaganda. This has been occurring on a massive scale since the first months of the invasion. Okay, we can switch the slide. Uh, talking about the methodology for this analysis, uh, a mixed methodology was applied, so a uh, collection of quantitative and qualitative data with regard to the presence of Russian guests on Italian TV. Uh, the criteria for being included in the group are an affiliation with Russian state media, with government institutions, membership of the United Russian Party, or uh, state-controlled university and public cultural institutions. Uh, following the identification of the TV uh, guests, the study uh, verified their connection with the Russian regime. Uh, a quantitative data analysis was carried out, and for each TV channel and program was provided the number of participants. Um, yeah, we can still stay on the previous, on the previous, yeah, thank you. So the observation spans from the 1st of March to the 30th of June 2022, the first four months of the war, when the attention of the public opinion was higher and more receptive. 
the TV networks taken into consideration, as you see, uh, RAI, the public broadcasting service, uh, Mediaset with the uh, uh, Rete 4, Rete 4, and La Sette, another private channel. Uh, the Mediaset uh, Rete 4 channel is owned by Berlusconi family. The other channel is also private and owned by another businessman. Um, okay, we can switch. <clears throat> Over the observed period, so from the 1st of March to the 30th of June 2022, the study identified 21 Russian individuals who participated in TV programs and matched the criteria to be included in the analysis group. Uh, they can be divided into three main categories um, based on their role and affiliation. So uh, state media, government and Duma, and finally, ideologues and academia. The list includes uh, notorious propaganda figures such as uh, Vladimir Solovyov, uh, the host of uh, the evening show on Russia One, and, uh, for example, Dmitry Kisilov, uh, appointed by Putin as CEO of the media group Russia Sivodnia. Also, two Zvezda journalists are directly connected to the Russian Defense Ministry, for example, Nadana Fridikson, uh, and others have connections to, to the FSB. Um, all the 12 journalists uh, are affiliated with media controlled by the Russian government. Russia 24, Russia 1, Pirvi Kanal, uh, Russia Sivodnia, Zvezda, Sputnik, and RT. Um, among the, reg the regime officials, invited on Italian TV are Foreign Minister uh, Lavrov, who was aired twice by Rete 4 in May 2022, and the spokesperson of the MFA, Maria Zakharova, uh, hosted by Rete 4 and La Sette. Um, we can switch slide. Over the four months period, the pool of 21 Russian propaganda guests was invited in total 67 times by 11 different TV shows from four channels, Rete 4, La Sette, Rai 3, and Rai, Rai 1, Rai 1. In particular, Rete 4 invited 15 Russian propagandists 36 times. La Sette hosted 11 of them for a total of 29 times. Rai 3 and Rai 1, Rai 3 and Rai 1, uh, one time respectively. Um, data showed that private TV channels gave significantly more space than the public broadcasting serving, uh, service RAI uh, to Russian propagandists. Um, usually the writers and the producers of the TV show justified the presence of these Russian guests uh, 60, 65 times on uh, La Sette and Rete 4 because Italian had to hear the other side of the story in the view. Uh, okay, next uh, slide. The evening show Dritto Rovescio on Rete 4 in, sp in the spring of uh, 2022 had an average audience of 1 million viewers and it hosted uh, different Russian propagandists, Olga Bielova, Alexander Dugin, uh, Alicia Luseva, uh, Ruslan Ostasko, uh, Daria Pushkova, Vladimir Solovyov, Yulia Vityasiva, for a total of 17 times, ranking first among the analyzed TV programs. In sum, uh, 15 Russian propagandists were hosted 36 times by Rete 4 and had a significant exposure to millions of Italians over the first four months of the invasion. La Sette ranked second for the number of guests and number of times that they were invited. Okay. So let's move to this part regarding uh, the poll uh, that in some way, in my view, confirm the influence that the Russian propaganda had on Italian, on the Italian public opinion. Um, According to this Ipsos survey conducted uh, in Italy in June 2022, 32% of respondents asked about the, cause, the causes of the conflict, the invasion, answered that NATO was threatening Russia, 
For a 26%, uh, this threat could not justify the aggression, while 6% thought it was a valid reason for Moscow to invade Ukraine. Another 26% did not answer the question, and only 42% said that Russia had no justification for the attack. Uh, what is more, 39% thought that the Italian media were unbalanced and too much in favor of Ukraine, while 45% agreed on providing visibility and space on Italian TV to Russian officials. Okay, next and last slide. Also, in this uh, May 2022 ECFR survey, 27% um, of Italian respondents uh, blamed Ukraine, the EU and or the US rather than Russia as the main responsi uh, responsible for the uh, outbreak of the war in Ukraine. This is the highest percentage among the 10 European countries surveyed by the ECFR. So, as these two polls show, uh, the pool of 21 um, Russian propaganda figures that had space and visibility on Italian uh, TV shows, especially in the first months of the war, in my view, had a huge impact on the orientation of the public opinion, or let's say on their disorientation, because uh, even now, mo most of them, most of the Italian public opinion uh, doesn't know uh, to recognize the causes and the responsibilities of the war. So, um, in my view, this was a significant success of the Russian propaganda machine. And uh, I would like to know from the other researchers, maybe tomorrow, if in the other countries uh, of Western Europe, especially, uh, the Russian propaganda had such a huge impact. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matteo, for your great presentation and your insights. And uh, as I said before, if there is any question, we will have, after panel one, we will have some period uh, in order to, to pose these questions. So now it's time to go to panel one, and I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Alejandro Fernandez Roldan, who is also a member of the organizing committee, and he's going to be the moderator for this panel one. So thank you to our two opening keynotes, and we start with panel one. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, good. Uh, well, hello, everyone. And after this uh, good opening session, uh, I want to welcome everyone to, uh, to our first panel, which is uh, called Disinformation, Media and Information Warfare in Contemporary Geopolitics. And for me, it's a pleasure to chair this panel uh, with wonderful speakers. Let me just make a very brief intro as we are running a little bit behind the schedule uh, by saying that in today's interconnected world, the role of information and the media is more crucial than ever, as you might know. And uh, obviously, this influences public opinion, it shapes narratives, and it impacts uh, geopolitical landscapes as well. So for this reason, we have assembled here this group of experts, and uh, I'm sure that our panelists will, will bring a wealth of experience and insights from their own research, uh, shedding light on the challenges that we face, and also exploring the strategies that we have to uh, navigate uh, in this uh, evolving landscape. So each presenter here will have 12 minutes for, for the presentation. Uh, to the speakers, I let you know when you have three minutes left and one minute left if, in case you want to jump uh, to the conclusions if you're running a little bit behind the, the schedule. And just to remind you that at the end of the session, we will have, as Daniel have said, um, a 10, 10 minutes Q&A uh, for potential questions that you might have. So without further ado, let me welcome our panelists. Uh, first of all, Olga Yurkova, uh, which is a prominent figure in the field of media literacy and, and fact checking. And she is obviously very well known for her role as co-founder of uh, Stop Fake. Uh, you know, Olga has been actively involved in promoting media literacy and critical thinking skills to combat the spread, the spread of, of false information, and particularly in the context of geopolitical events. So, through Stop Fake, she and her team have played a crucial role in debunking disinformation uh, related to, to Russia's uh, propaganda. Uh, but also, she has played a role in, in other global issues. So, uh, Olga, the floor is yours. Uh, 
uh, so ladies and gentlemen, let me just share my presentation. Do you see my presentation? Yes, we can, Olga. Okay, thank you so much. One second, I will start it. So, uh, good afternoon again. Uh, I'm happy to present my findings here. Let me tell you about using informal communications, uh, specifically rumors, uh, as a tool of information war. Uh, let me start with the distinction between um, formal and informal communications in uh, social context. You can see them all in this, on this slide. Uh, depending on the distribution channel, social communications can be divided into formal and informal ones. Formal communications uh, information mainly in the form of text or stories is spread through um, predetermined distribution channels. Olga, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're not seeing the first slide. Uh, we're ah, just yes. seeing like the whole uh, set of uh, slides. Now we can see mm -hmm. it. Okay. If you could, if you could start okay. like the presentation. Um, Maybe I can just, uh, uh, so let me just uh, uh, click. Uh, are they changing now? Yeah, they are changing, yes. Okay, unfortunately I cannot <laughs> demonstrate slide show for some reason. Okay, okay. So I will just. I'll change the slides. Uh, okay, <laughs> so okay, again, um, uh, you can see the distinction between formal and informal communications on this slide. And uh, so, depending on the, the distribution channel, social communication can be divided into well, uh, formal and Sorry, informal. Sorry, could you please turn into presentation view? Because we are looking at all your slides. Uh, presentation. Could you click on presentation view? Slide show. Do you mean slide show, maybe? Yeah. Yes, presentation view. Yes. Are my slides slide changes changing? It's not changing at the moment. I don't know what the, what the issue it is because I <laughs> I exactly uh, clicked uh, like ch chose chose the um, presentation view. Okay, we can we can share from our technical secretariat your presentation. Oh, I, would be, I would be grateful. Yeah. Yes. So please, technical secretariat, can you could you please share? All that? Yes. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, sorry for this issue. I don't know why, why it happened. Okay, so uh, formal inf uh, inf communications information is spread through predetermined distribution channels, including, for example, the media statements of officials, documents, etc. And uh, the subject of my study is informal communications, so which generally include mainly verbal communications, such as rumors, gossip, anecdotes, and songs, sometimes written down but spread in informal ways. My study focuses on rumors as the most significant uh, part of informal communication. So, formal communications, in contrast to informal ones, are standardized, stable, stereotyped, and structured reflecting the neutral influence of various social institutions. Mm. Instead, informal communications are primarily interpersonal, based on trust, do not operate with rational arguments, are spontaneous, and are not systematized. So, they, they can complement formal communications. Please, uh, the next slide. Uh, investigating the peculiarities of informal communications, I collected and analyzed 400 rumors. Uh, that spread in the information space of Ukraine after the full-scale invasion by Russia. So the period of collecting rumors uh, is from February 22, 2022. 
uh, to October 13, 2023. Uh, the next slide, please. And here you see the essence of some classic definitions of rumors. According to NEP, a rumor is an offer to believe actual information distributed uh, without official verification. Uh, offers enforcement um, in 2047 uh, uh, define a rumor as a specific or topical proposition for belief, passed along from person to person, usually by word of mouth without secure standards of evidence being present. Sibutani uh, then postulates that rumors are a form of communication that helps people in an uncertain situation to unite, to understand it, and give a reasonable interpretation using their minds. So the science of rumors, in addition to word of mouth transmission and uncertain reliability, is the topicality and uncertainty of the circumstances of their um, emergence. Next slide, please. Uh, according to Shibutani, a rumor's basis is an event with two features, uh, importance and uncertainty. Rumor is at equal to importance multiplied by uncertainty. A variant of this formula is the so-called Olbert's law, or oh, sorry, uh, some uh, typo, uh, according to which the rumor is derived from the importance of the event multiplied by its ambiguity. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so, self-transmission is one of the critical features of rumors. Uh, Yogi Pochepso calls three main reasons for it. First, lack of relevant information in the mass media and official communication. Rumors often uh, contain information about which the official communication is silent. So the zone of silence of the media is the zone of spread of the rumors. Second, rumors are a response to the collective unconscious. According to Jung, they express the arche uh, archetypal phenomena. They fix and materialize the collective fears and hopes of society, and in my research, I classify rumors according to the emotions they provoke. And the third cause of the self-spread of rumors is crowd psychology. Rumors respond to public desires. It is the communication of a crowd to which logic is inapplicable. In a crowd, individuals become less critical, less moral, and more vulnerable to influence. Uh, the next slide, please. And now, with the development of social media, Characteristics of rumors, such, uh, such as words of mouth, mouth or orality, are no longer mandatory. But when rumors spread on the internet, they have some specific features. Uh, the lack of nuance is associated with the lack of tactile and visual contact. Uh, however, the internet language, even written down, holds the features of orality in its content. Uh, then, third set of rumors is implemented by the report function. Sometimes with comments, it can be considered as a way to remove responsibility for the content of the rumor from the repeater, because they just report. Uh, then, social media provides a possibility of complete anonymity of communicators. Also, the Internet has opinion leaders or super communicators. They influence other users, so the purpose spread of rumors depends on whether they pick up or refute them. And finally, the spread of rumors can be automated using bots or using bots and trolls. Maybe. Okay, the next slide. Uh, today, three main basics for the emergence of rumors can be singled out. You can see it on the slide. First, this deformation of the information space in a situation subjectively crucial for the audience. Second, simultaneous growth of social tension and Third, uh, due to formal communication, the audience does not receive answers to their questions. Uh, an example of such a situation in uh, the rumors um, is the rumor in uh, June 2023, this year, of a possible nuclear provocation at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, uh, controlled by the Russian occupiers after Ukrainian intelligence uh, reports about this. Due to the great significance of the situation for the audience, this news strongly impacted the information field. The Ukrainian audience was actively looking for answers to whether uh, there would be an explosion, what power, 
how to avoid the consequences, etc. Uh, the official communication did not give answers to these questions or gave them partially. For example, it tried to debunk the myth uh, about the need to buy uh, iodine in pharmacies. So rumors continued to arise and public tensions, uh, tensions grew. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, then uh, Robert Knapp developed the key and most well-known uh, classification of rumors based on emotional impact. In parentheses, you can see uh, the number of rumors of each type in our sample of uh, uh, 200 rumors. So 74 of these rumors were identified in the sample. A very popular modern example of wishful thinking is about the deadly disease of death uh, or deaths of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Such kind of rumors sometimes can support the morale of society. For example, there, um, there is a rumor about a uh, virtuoso fighter pilot, the ghost of Kiev, which circulated in the, uh, the beginning of the full-scale invasion. Uh, but on the other, on the other hand, uh, sometimes they create inflated expectations. Uh, that later do, uh, do not come true and result in frustration of society. Secondly, I identified uh, 156 body rumors, uh, reflect consequences that cause fear. They often refer to the fear of future events, destructive shelling, the use of unconventional lethal weapons by the enemy, terrorist attacks that will lead to environmental disaster, etc. Psychologically, people spread them because shared fear is more manageable to live through. The provoked emotions run the scale from mild pessimism, pessimism to outright panic. They are used to intimidate people uh, to, or induce specific behavior. Finally, the biggest part of the sample look, uh, took aggression almost, 188 identified examples. Uh, this suggests that the primary efforts of Russian propaganda during the war are focused on weakening and sowing division in Ukrainian society. For example, these are stories about ungrateful refugees or uh, internally displaced persons, IDPs, who damage the property of their hosts and support Russia. This story was actively spread in different regions of Ukraine, but there is no proven evidence. In addition, rumors are always related to the specific audience. For, for different audiences, the same rumor can, different, uh, can have different connotations. For Ukrainians, the rumor about Putin's cancer or death is wishful. And for Russians who support Putin, it is a body rumor. Rumors also can contain elements of several types. For example, the rumor about conflict in Ukraine's military and political leadership is an aggression rumor with elements of body rumor because it increases the uh, pessimistic attitudes in society. Olga, you uh, have three minutes left. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, next slide, please. So, given the self spread nature of rumors, the life cycle of rumor uh, is determined by the dynamics of its spread. Stopping the spread uh, would mean the fading and death of the rumor. The life cycle of rumors differ. Some die naturally as the audience gets tired of the topic. Some rumors disappear when tensions that cause them are eliminated or when they are successfully refuted. Uh, and um, researchers know a wide range of rumor lifespans from instant rumors like there will be shelling uh, shell now to uh, at epochal rumors like that Stalin's death uh, was no accident. So it can be assumed that the lifespan of a rumor depend on the, depends on the number of interested people and how long the rumor can interest them. So, and um, an extended stay of a specific rumor at the peak of popularity is often possible in case of artificial support of interest in it, like propagandistic efforts. And so, um, uh, microblog rumors researchers uh, distinguish the stages of birth, growth, and decline, but without death, because in this case, the rumor uh, remains alive in the internet. Uh, okay, yeah. go to the next slide, because we don't have enough time. Uh, um, next slide, please. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, I just, I can just uh, tell you about what I, 
Uh, according to Shabutani, a rumor mongering is sometimes seen as a form of, of collective problem solving involving providing, exchanging, and evaluating information. So, uh, corrective behavior is also a part of the rumor life cycle. That's why studies uh, that previously focused on the spread of rumors began to cover the correct. One minute. So, oh, okay, thank you. So, um, so. What I would like to say finally is the influence of informal communications or on social or social political processes requires expanding the research field and actualizing the scientific discussion regarding this phenomenon because the topic of rumors during the war in social media and the interaction with mass media requires further research to develop the role of uh, media in um, spreading uh, rumors and develop in content, uh, effective um, means to counter in this kind of information influence. Thank you. If I have any question, I can uh, tell it in more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga. And I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, <laughs> to, to let you know oh, the time that was <laughs> remaining. Yeah. You. Uh, yeah. Because your research is very interesting and, and yeah, we, I mean, uh, 12 minutes i know it's uh, it's difficult to summarize all the findings and, and all the things that you have to say uh but thank you uh i'm sure that there will be questions about that i have uh, my own <laughs> actually and uh i also take the opportunity to tell uh the audience that um, at the end we have the q a but they might as well uh text uh in in our comment section uh the questions if they, if they happen um and now let me just present uh, our next speaker, uh, who is Andrea Langbecker, uh, presenting the importance of experimental designs on how this information influences public perception. Uh, Andrea is a researcher who belongs to the uh, Media Lab Group at the Department of Communications uh, and Media Studies at Carlos III, and she has published several articles and book chapters related to health communication. Uh, she holds a position of science journalism here, and uh, Andrea has obtained her degree in journalism and has completed her PhD uh, in public health at Brazilian universities. So, Andrea, if you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, wait a minute, man. Okay. I'm going to show you my, my presentation. Okay, perfect, Andrea. Remember that if you have like any technical issue, we can- uh, Can you share. see my presentation? It seems so. Can you uh, play these slides like in the proper presentation? Yes, I think we can. Is it okay? Yes. Uh, well, I, I will interrupt you uh, towards the end when you have three minutes left, and then when when you have one minute left, to, so that you can jump. Okay, okay no problem. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the committee for the invitation, especially uh, Daniel Catalan Matamoros, and I'm very uh, glad to be here. I'm going to talk about the importance of ex experimental designs or on how this information influences public perception. I think it's very important to start with, with some concepts and uh, experimentation, uh, for example, is used to determine the extent of causal connections between two or more variables and it evaluates predictions uh, regarding causal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, relationships through the manipulation of elements within a specific context or activity, followed by the observation of results, perceptual and behavioral outcomes. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, other concepts uh, that are very important are randomization and control. Randomization involves assigned participants purely by chance, and control group is the group that uh, doesn't receive the experimental treatment or intervention. 
it's adopted as a point of comparison to evaluate the effects of the treatment in the experimental groups. It means it's very useful uh, to work with control, control group because you can uh, compare the results of the control group with, with the results of uh, experimental group. And then you can evaluate the effects of uh, the treatment. Don't know why I can. Okay. Okay. Uh, another thing it's very important is to consider uh, to comply with ethical requirements when conducting any experiment involving humans. Uh, the project should be evaluated by an ethics committee and uh, all the respondents must give their permission uh, to participate in the research and the data must be completely anonymized uh, during the analysis and when we release the results. Uh, well, I'm going now talking about uh, uh, how can we, uh, there are some possibilities and idea and uh, how can you use experiment uh, to investigate this information. I think it would be interesting to use experiments when seeking to evaluate, for example, uh, whether exposure to fake news affects or changes someone's perception of a certain event. Participants could be randomly exposed to different false stories about a specific, a specific event. For all, afterwards, uh, all participants should understand and uh, answer I'm sorry, a questionnaire about the topic to uncertain whether the treatment have influenced the responses compared to the control group. Uh, in the case of an experiment investigating this information, it's essential to provide correct additional information at the end of the experiment. Another possibility would be to evaluate whether the message format influences or changes someone's perception of a certain fact. For example, narratives such as storytelling, short or long, or use of testimonials on first-person accounts are considered more persua persuasive than other formats. It happens because when the people identify themselves with the story, values, and points of view, the story can help them to make decisions about an issue, stimulate the behavior change, or encourage them to increase their interest in an attention to a certain issue. For example, the methods with disinformation in general have used narrative framing as a strategy to convince people that it's true. Uh, another possibility uh, to investigate this information is through, through surveys experiments. Survey experiments in an experiment administered to a representative population. Uh, it's very useful if you want uh, 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 to work with a large sample, for example. The internet has increased our possibility of developing of this kind of, um, this kind of experiment. Uh, the fact that the survey was conducted online could be interesting. Uh, however, in this contest, less attention is paid than in a laboratory setting, which would go against detecting any effect of the treatments. It means that uh, participants have more attention in a lab than in an online survey. Uh, now, uh, you have an example of an experiment survey. Uh, it's an article uh, was published in El Profesional de la Información. Uh, its title is Fact or Fiction, an experiment on how information sources and message framing influence vaccine risk perception. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's from the area of health communication, but I think it's an interesting example uh, to, to note 
uh, some methodological approaches. Uh, we conduct an online, online experiment with 1,800 residents in Spain. Uh, the objective of our study was to evaluate the influence on Rick's perception of the information sources and message framing uh, related to COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, participants were randomly exposed to different messages. Uh, we conducted two experiments, experiment one, uh, related uh, to different source of information and experiment two, different message framing. Uh, we, we had a control group, it means some response uh, didn't receive any message. And uh, next step, every server responded had to provide an evaluation of a questionnaire on a one uh, to 10 scale. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, when, uh, well, some results uh, that uh, I wanted to show here. Uh, we found that respond will receive the versions uh, with messages, messages uh, with uh, data, scientific data, or uh, storytelling. Uh, tend to evaluate the safety of vaccines for children better than responds who received the neutral message. Uh, these results highlight the importance of effective communication strategies to face off disinformation. I think it's an uh, important result. And well, we had uh, some limitations. Uh, the server was self-administered, which doesn't guarantee that all respondents understood the questions or were totally honest in their responses. Well, uh, there are some ideas and possibilities uh, if you want to investigate uh, this information. Uh, thank you. Okay, Andrea, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Um, yeah, you, I didn't have to, to tell you about the time. You did very, very uh, time-wise. Uh, so let's move on to our next uh, presentation. This time is uh, Olena Churanova uh, presenting transformation of Russian disinformation narratives about the EU in the context of the Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, Olena is a Ukrainian journalist, a fact checker, and she's also a media researcher with uh, extensive experience in combating disinformation and, and promoting media literacy. And she is uh, currently a fact checker at uh, Stop Fake as well. Uh, but she has also worked for several prominent uh, media outlets, including the, the Ukrainian service for Voice of America, uh, Radio Zvodova, and the European Journalism Observatory. So whenever you are ready, uh, the floor is yours, Olena. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Yeah. Great, so the main challenge right now is to open my presentation. <laughs> okay, don't worry, just let, let me remind people that uh, we have the Q&A, that they can leave their uh, questions in, in this chat, or maybe they can uh, participate, jump in, in the conversation live. And let me remind you, Elena, that uh, I'll let you know when you have like three minutes left and also one minute left to jump to the conclusions. Mm -hmm. Okay. You didn't see my presentation, right? No, not really. But uh, yeah, um, just just let me, let me remind you that we can share your uh, presentation. Um, I tried once more. Okay. If I couldn't, I ask you to do it. Now, so I think that it will be easier if you could. Okay. Open it. Technical Secretariat, <laughs> if you can uh, help us with uh, sharing uh, Olena's presentation. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, um, oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I thought, say when you could uh, put the, the, the check, go to the next slide. So, greetings, everyone, once more. Uh, previous slide, previous slide. <laughs> 
yeah thank you uh i would like you so i would like to you to present uh our research on how uh narratives about the eu uh have changed in russian propaganda based on uh the banks of uh, the stop fake project uh first and foremost uh, why the stop fake materials were chosen for this uh, research of course not not just because i work there or because our project uh is a partner in uh, organizing this congress uh in fact the database uh contained in stop fake uh, is an excellent resource for researching Rus russian disinformation uh stop fake itself was created uh in uh, at the very beginning of russia's massive information war against ukraine on 2nd march of 2014 and our organization was created at that time to counter this uh, massive of this information against Ukraine, highlight it and collect evidence about information crisis, uh, crimes of Russia. Uh, it's important to mention also that our fact checkers are, choos are choosing fakes based on the relevance, distribution scale and possible threat scale. The next slide please. Uh, therefore, by studying the debunking of uh, stock fake, we analyze the most widespread and dangerous fakes which are already collected in one place. Uh, additionally, uh, the focus of our research has been on anti-EU narratives, specifically the debunking uh, related to European countries. Uh, we choose this direction because it was the desire of Ukrainians to join the EU that sparked protest uh, on the Euromaidan at the first place. And also because the further Ukraine moves in the European direction, the more aggressively Russia uh, perceives it. And today, during uh, the full-scale war, uh, the European Union state stands as one of uh, Ukraine's uh, largest and most important allies. And therefore, Russia's information aggression towards such allies uh, aligns with Russia's information strategy. So through the debunking efforts of stop fake, we aim to form a picture of narratives uh, described by the Kremlin against Europe and identify the main trends in information operation against the EU. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, in total, out of um, uh, over 5,000 articles, uh, materials, uh, we selected 664 uh, materials that um, met our specific criteria. Uh, we could categorize these debunkings by narratives, time, uh, before and after the uh, full-scale invasion, and uh, by countries mentioned in the materials. Uh, and the primary methods that we used in this research was content analysis. Uh, also, uh, we posed uh, three uh, main research questions in this research. What disinformation narratives about the EU uh, were propagated from 2014 to 2023? And did the landscape uh, change uh, with Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine? Uh, which European countries are most frequently featured in disinformation narratives and in what context? And also, can a database of the fact-checking project uh, serve as a basis for research? and analysis of information operation. So um, the next slide, please. And the main conclusions regarding uh, narratives against the EU uh, up to the full-scale invasion uh, are as follows. Uh, the theme of the pandemic or COVID-19 uh, group of narratives was the popular one, as you could see here. And uh, it can be explained by uh, the incredible growth of disinformation featuring European countries during the pandemic. Uh, with the help of this so-called infodemic, uh, the Kremlin aimed to demonstrate uh, the European Union's uh, inability to handle such crises and to propagate various conspiracy theories, uh, including those against vaccination, against uh, evidence-based medicines, and so on. And furthermore, Russia propaganda leveraged the theme of the pandemic uh, to cast doubts uh, on the relationship between uh, European country and countries and Ukraine, and to spray the narrative that Ukraine would receive no support uh, during challenging times. Uh, on the second place, uh, as one of the main and central messages of Kremlin propaganda uh, regarding Ukraine, uh, that Ukraine is a failed state, a country that should not exist. A significant increase in the use of these narratives uh, narrative occurred in 2016, uh, precisely when the cessation of agreement with the EU was ratified. Uh, the third most uh, widely spread group of narratives is dedicated to decline of Western support uh, for, for Ukraine. 
Among other popular uh, narratives, uh, as you could see here, uh, seems are uh, related to the fake legalization of uh, uh, Crimea, uh, annexation of Crimea, and the occupation of Donbass. Uh, claims uh, that EU uh, is actually an aggressor, and uh, these claims depicts uh, European countries as those who benefit from war, who are ready to attack neighboring countries, and also. Um, narratives uh, uh, that Ukraine is a fascist state, of course, that uh, EU actually controls Ukraine. Uh, and also it's important to mention uh, the narratives uh, categorized as territorial claims. Uh, it's narratives that aim to create a perception that European countries uh, constantly seek to uh, take parts of Ukraine for themselves, deploy the military forces there and uh, do not consider Ukraine as independent country. Uh, so, to conclude, from 2014 to 2022, Russian disinformation pro uh, propaganda, uh, disinformation machine, uh, disseminated a range of, of narratives related to the EU European countries and Ukraine with the aim to create a negative image of both sides. And uh, the most widespread disinformation narratives actually serves, served as argument to, uh, for Russia to launch uh, a full-scale aggression against Ukraine. Uh, the next slide, please. And uh, speaking about the main narratives after the full-scale invasion start, um, we could see that uh, the map of narratives has been changed somewhat. For example, the topic of Ukrainian refugees in the EU uh, is one of uh, the most represented in this database. Um, and uh, if we, we could... Uh, See uh, the previous uh, stats that uh, these narratives had only 2.7%, um, but uh, and it, it was mostly represented in 2014, 2015. Uh, but uh, after the full scale invasion, it became one of the most popular narratives uh, that spread by Russian propaganda and aimed to uh, create this negative image of refugees and also of Western democracies who allegedly uh, don't want to support Ukrainians. Uh, military aid uh, to Ukraine is the most represented narrative here, uh, and it uh, is a new one uh, that we um, identify um, after the full-scale uh, invasion. And uh, with these narratives, Russia tried to spread different uh, different uh, topics that we um, put in uh, subtopics. Uh, but um, if to conclude it, uh, Russia tried to uh, create disillusionment among the Ukrainian audience and European par partners uh, by promoting false claims uh, of weak and poor quality support. On the other hand, it created distrust among the Western audience about the proper use of this weapon and the integrity of the Ukrainian side. Uh, we also noted uh, the appearance of two new narratives here. As you could see, they in yellow color. Uh, no Ukraine in the EU and NATO, and Ukraine, uh, EU wants Ukraine to lose this war. Uh, and this seems Russian disinformation uh, discredits uh, European assistance, emphasizing that it, it's not sincere and in, intentionally uh, ineffective. Uh, thus, it can be noted that with full-scale invasion, Russia's main topic in the information war with the EU have become uh, military aid, uh, support for Ukraine, uh, refugees, portrayal of European countries as aggressors, uh, those who are only ready to fuel uh, the war further, uh, and narratives about different uh, crises and territorial claims as well. Uh, the next slide, please. And also when discussing the countries that featured the most uh, uh, prominently in the debunks, uh, we saw uh, that uh, actually we, uh, it's uh, like the most powerful allies of Ukraine. And of course, the Kremlin's goal here- Three to minutes, under Solana, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the uh, Kremlin goals here to undermine Ukraine's relations with its most powerful allies and to use historical background. Uh, to exacerbate conflict situations and to influence in any way possible to stop any support for Ukraine. Uh, differences in disinformation narratives uh, are observed across different countries depending on their specific characteristics, the nature of their cooperation with Ukraine, the political stance on Ukraine's integration uh, into the EU, and so on. Uh, for example, regarding to Poland, uh, regarding Poland, um, 
uh, there is a consistent effort to portray this country uh, uh, that uh, it's attempting to occupy Ukraine and seize its territory. Uh, and if you're talking, for example, about Germany, uh, one of the most popular narratives uh, is uh, Ukraine as a failed state and also military aid. Uh, in summary, the main trends we identified during our research uh, are follows. The next slide, please. Uh, it's uh, that, that um, we identify that uh, the transformation of anti-EU narratives through the Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, as examined in the light of stop fake debunks, shows that Russia mobilized its uh, resources, disinformation resources, and uh, perceived European countries as a threat and as enemies. Uh, also, the widespread use of the category of narratives like Ukraine as a failed state, state topics uh, about military aid, decline of Western support, refugees, illustrate that uh, Russia seeks uh, by any means to undermine Ukraine's relationship with its allies and justify its military aggression against Ukraine. Uh, furthermore, the analysis of debunk debunked uh, claims related to specific countries uh, revealed that Russia tail, uh, Russia uh, uh conduct information were tailored to each country individually and also research demonstrated uh, that uh, the work of fact checking organization can mirror the processes of information operation conducted by adversaries and could help to assist strategic planning for planning for responses to these information operations uh, thank you for your attention <laughs> i try to be brief Thank you very much, Olena. You you were very very good at keeping uh, your presentation within within time and also like reporting very interesting findings. So um, thanks again, and let me move on to our final uh, speaker in this uh, first panel of the conference. Um, it's for me a pleasure to present Felipe Núñez, who is also a PhD candidate in the Department of Communications and Media Studies uh, here at University Carlos III of Madrid and his research uh, focuses on science communication and political communication and broadly and um, also he studies this or his approaches from the perspective of uh, media effects and he's presenting today uh, the case of russia today as a, as a disinformation tool so whenever you are ready felipe uh, felipe you can you can start your presentation Hi, Alejandro. Can you can you hear yes. me? Yes. Hello, hello. Yes, we can we can hear you. Okay, I will share the slides. Okay, it's we fine. can see it. Yes, try to move on, on to the next one. Just just to check that it goes with the flow. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Whenever okay. you want. Let's start, and uh, I promise that I will be. As quicker as I, as I can, but uh, thank you for for moderating uh, this uh, panel, Alejandro, and also thank you for all the people that uh, make this uh, congress uh, possible. But uh, let's start here. Uh, a few days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, European countries and uh, the social media platforms, uh, Twitter and Instagram, blocked the account of Russia Today channel. Accusing, uh, accusing it of uh, being an instrument of uh, disinformation in the service of the uh, Russian government. Cross uh, accusations uh, between the West and Russia regarding propaganda are not new, but the creation of uh, deliberative, uh, ign deliberate ignorance uh, through the new form of uh, disinformation is something new. Um, if we wanted to to, um, to trace uh, the origin of uh, persuasion and propaganda, we will uh, have to return to, uh, to Aristotelian rhetoric. Don't worry, because <laughs> we will not uh, go that far. But uh, I only want to point out that uh, from this uh, common origin, we could identify these uh, two initial concepts. Uh, for one hand, we have a persuasion that is a broader concept it's referred uh, to convincing someone to adopt uh, a point of view or behavior voluntarily. But on the other hand, uh, we have a propaganda, 
that usually is associated uh, with uh, authoritarian regimes. It's a deliberate uh, systematic act of manipulating behavior and pursuit uh, of a benefit for the propagandist. <clears throat> so, uh, with the appearance uh, of internet and digital platforms, especially over the last uh, decade, global society has had uh, to cope uh, with the rise of the phenomenon of uh, misinformation. In our minds, the development of this event has created, a, let's say, a semantic uh, field of words that uh, have become associated with political events. For example, um, we can think that uh, Donald Trump's rise to the United States uh, presidency or the Brexit uh, campaign is inseparable from the from terms such as um, fake news or post-truth or misinformation, disinformation. This uh, rise and popularization of uh, this concept serve as, as an indicator of a latent problem. The emergence of uh, a contemporary culture of ignorance, characterized by the resistance to uh, verifiable facts. The current situation is different from the classical propaganda because uh, instead of trying to convince uh, people of a certain truth, the, cur the current uh, system aims to create a sense of uh, confusion uh, that uh, some authors uh, call it like a epistemic uh, a state of uh, epistemic anarchy. And this is, um, I highlighted this, um, this content because it, uh, this situation brings us directly to the idea of agnotology. What is uh, agnotology? So the concept of uh, agnotology uh, is introduced uh, by the historian of science, uh, Robert Proctor, to denounce the disinformation campaign uh, originated by the tobacco industry. Basically, the tobacco companies create and support uh, alternative studies uh, to official ones to create doubt, doubts uh, between tobacco and lung uh, this, this size. But in this case, it's in this concept is interesting uh, because uh, uh, we want, uh, I wanted to introduce uh, or to connect this concept with the um, analyzing the role of a state, Russia in this case, that use disinformation tactics and ultimately uh, the creation of ignorance and doubt in public opinion as a valuable uh, tool for geopolitical strategies. Russia government, uh, well, this information plays a significant role in uh, Russia's uh, national security strategy. It's part of a historical response that, uh, uh, to what they perceive as the previous use of this strategy uh, by the West, particularly by the United States to isolate uh, Russia internationally. Whoever, uh, this strategy is not unique uh, to the Russia government uh, because uh, other nations like the United States, China have also employed uh, disinformation tactics uh, to promote their national interest. But in this case, we are focusing on uh, Russia, Russia case. So, um, Russia propaganda efforts uh, have been interpreted through the theory of reflexive uh, control which seeks uh, to find an opponent uh, weakness and exploit them to aggravate the ideological polarization and weaken institution in that territory. It is known as uh, sharp uh, power and seeks to penetrate the media system uh, of target countries. The Russia government has been successfully uh, in levering social media and platforms to foment the social and political unrest using bots and other cyber threats 
as tool uh, to manage the information environment and spread the propaganda on social media. In this, con in this uh, context, uh, these strategies are adapted to the codes and also to the specific uh, jargon uh, to each platform, such as uh, the use of uh, memes or memes. Um, for example, this, uh, this paper studied this um, the, the use of memes of uh, memes in uh, in the conflict between uh, in uh, in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. The Russian government, um, uh, well, this uh, this situation had led uh, to allegations uh, in recent years that uh, Russia has been actively involved in interfering uh, in electoral process in the West, using tactics uh, to divide the society and undermine the democracy. Such allegations of uh, political interference have been investigated, for example, in the, in the uh, 2016 uh, United States uh, elections. So uh, in short, uh, let's say that uh, this information plays a fundamental role in the Russian government's strategy. Uh, in this strategy, Russia uh, has taken advantage in social media and other cyber threats. But, uh, however, uh, the traditional media also plays an important role in this plot. So, for this reason, um, um, I want uh, to introduce uh, the case of uh, Russia today as a special case uh, uh, that is an uh, international television channel financed uh, by the Russian government. Felipe, you have uh, slightly above three minutes. Okay, so I'm finishing. So the case of, uh, well, to explain the case of uh, Russia today, First, uh, we need to provide some historical context that uh, from the, the um, from the 2000 to 2005, uh, um, the prevailing notion of in the media was that Russia had lost its uh, former uh, its former influence and power. Uh, these were the early years, and that Vladimir Putin, as uh, Russia's uh, president, a figure who. Um, from the outset, it was portrayed uh, by the international press as an autocrat. But uh, in contrast, uh, within the country, or inside uh, Russia, Putin was seen as, uh, as the person who had uh, brought, brought back uh, Russian pride, lost at the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So to solve this problem uh, uh, of a bad image uh, abroad, the uh, Russian government developed a soft power strategy. Uh, creating a new channel, Russia Today, uh, television, a uh, new uh, tele international uh, channel, is uh, Russia Today, that would explain uh, the Russian perspective of global uh, news to other countries. However, behind this uh, alternative uh, version of Western reality, uh, Russian channel accumulates uh, numerous accusations of uh, deliberately spreading disinformation and false stories uh, in order to solve doubts and confusion in the context of uh, information warfare. So uh, the evolution of Russia today uh, is significant because initially uh, Russia today focused on promoting Russian culture and positive Russian news, but uh, subsequently exper experienced a notable shift uh, towards uh, promoting the political interests of the Russian government. The turning point, uh, point came during the Russian-Georgia conflict in 2008. Uh, the Georgian uh, war marked a turning point in Russia's media protection abroad. And uh, after this uh, conflict, uh, Russia Today changed uh, the name uh, uh, in uh, RT, the, the brand that we can see in the image. Um, uh, like uh, because in this uh, strategy, the appearance uh, apparently apparently uh, the media the media channel is uh, less linked uh, to the Russian government, and uh, but in this uh, in this way 
it began to produce uh, this information to spread the propaganda under two principles. To show the idea that the Western countries faced uh, similar problems that, uh, to Russia and to promote controversies uh, and conspiracy theories that would damage uh, Western media. For example, when Russia Today uh, America began broadcasting in uh, uh, 2010, uh, it hired a program on the possibility that the 9-11 terrorist attack uh, was prepared internally by the United States government. One minute, Felipe. So, okay, uh, I will be finished that, uh, saying that uh, this uh, way uh, it spread uh, an anti elitist uh, message that uh, the um, citizen of the United States public can share. And Russia today use uh, conspiracy developed within the Western countries themselves. It exploited the disaffection of a disgrounded citizen uh, and exploit the internal tensions uh, within that society. Consequently, uh, this allowed uh, to introduce other conspiracy theories about relations between uh, Russia and the West. So, for for end, I want to like to show you like um, a study that uh, can be like uh, summarize all this idea. Uh, uh, in this uh, in this study, in this qualitative study. Uh, Mona Elswa and Philip uh, Howard interviewed a journalist who had uh, worked in Russia Today's newsroom. Uh, one, uh, one journalist, uh, confused by the Russia Today's line on the event of Brexit, asked uh, his editor about the Russia Today's uh, position on Brexit. And the uh, editor's uh, response was, anything that causes uh, chaos is uh, Russia Today's line. So um, this support the idea that the uh, uh, agnotology or the agnotology approach is, uh, is useful for analyze also the, the Russian propaganda uh, because uh, in the present uh, moment, uh, it's, just, it's uh, let's say that it's not only important to consider what propagandists uh, want to think, want us uh, to think, but it's also essential to consider what the uh, propagandists want uh, us uh, to ignore. So I will finish here and I'm ready for some question, if there is. Okay, Felipe, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have reached the end of this uh, panel, but we have uh, a few minutes uh, for potential questions to our speakers and also to the speakers of the of the opening of the opening session. Uh, perhaps you can use the raise hand feature in in this platform. Uh, I'm going to check if there's like any question on YouTube. There are none. Um, if no one has questions, I will briefly. OK. Uh, Mark has uh, one question, please. Could you uh, open up your microphone? And, and... I have a question for <clears throat> um, for Rafael, who was the uh, the the, uh, the expert on Italy. I'm, I follow uh, his presentation very um, with a lot of interest because I think that several things that we see in Italy, uh, the are trying to to kind of export it to export into Spain, even though with not as much success as in as in Italy. Uh, but definitely, after being in in in, in Moscow for eleven years, my impression is that um, the Russians feel that uh, Spain could be a second Italy. But and that is you know but the, only, the one thing that uh, we know that um, Russia. I would like to ask him um, how effective it has been or it has been the the the, the commission the. the Executive Commission that was set up by the Parliament <clears throat> on Russian disinformation last year is it making any uh, any progress? Is it actually um, is there any result? Uh, and yeah, that's basically my question. Okay, uh, you can answer this question, and I've been told that we are running. Uh, behind the schedule. So after this, uh, we would need to end uh, our session. And if you have like any potential question that you really want to to be um, 
address, uh, perhaps you could send us an email and, and we'll send them uh, forward them to the participants. So Matteo, the question is for Matteo Pugliese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. You could be brief as well, please. Yeah, sure. Um, I was actually interested to um, uh, study further this topic, not just about Italy, but other countries in Western Europe, because uh, I think there are some commonalities, but on the other hand, uh, the Italian information system was much more uh, permeated and infiltrated by um, this idea that also the Russian side should have a say in the situation in Ukraine, so they gave a lot of space uh, to uh, representatives of the Russian institutions, as well as uh, you, you were correct when you said that uh, they should not be called journalists because uh, those representatives from the Russian state media are actually, in my view, not journalists but just uh, propaganda uh, agents who uh, repeat over and over the narratives that uh, they were provided by. Uh, the Russian government over the last uh, few years. Um, actually, there is not much awareness in Italy about this problem yet. Uh, there is, uh, of course, the the work of the uh, IDMO in Florence, but also the other institutions working on countering this information. But uh, in my view, the main problem is that there is no awareness in the uh, TV system, uh, in the, the producers, the writers, the, ho the, the hosts of the TV programs who uh, do not understand that uh, if you give space to this kind of propaganda without a proper mechanism of fact-checking and debunking live in the show or at least uh, in the next uh, episode of the show, uh, people will start step-by-step uh, step uh, thinking that these narratives are true. So uh, much more should be done and the parliament uh, so far did not uh, produce any, uh, let's say, concrete step in this regard. Okay, Matteo, uh, thank you very much for, an for your answer. And uh, I'm sorry that we have to uh, bring this session to an end so that the following panel uh, can start not, uh, with much delay. Thank you very much for uh, all your presentations and, and for all the attendance to uh, to watch us and uh, let's move on with our next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. And now we are moving to the next uh, panel. So, Olga, you have the floor as the moderator of the next one. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good day once again. Dear participants, I stay with you. I will moderate the presentation section um, uh, for the next hour and 15 minutes. I don't know why. Uh -huh. uh, do you see my video? Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, I, I will moderate the presentation section for the next hour and 15 minutes. My name is Olga Yukova. I am co-founder of Stockfake. Thank you for coming to this session. And I will now invite six Diamond speakers to this virtual stage to present the results of their research and the research of their teams. And today we have a colorful set of topics. They cover the impact of disinformation and fact-checking in various areas of our lives explanatory journalism, infodemic management and health response, disinformation about global warming, the effectiveness of training, uh, improving critical thinking, and of course, countering disinformation and the role of fact-checking agencies, especially in Europe. So each speaker will have approximately an eight-minute presentation, and we will have a 15-minute question and answer session at the end. Please remember to send questions to the chat if you have any. Uh, and dear speakers, I will give you a time when you have two minutes to finish. I invite on stage uh, Rocio Lopez Inigo, one of the co-authors of the research Inequity Driven Mistrust, its impact to infodemic management and health response and what to do about it. 
Uh, Rocio Lopez uh, is an expert at risk communication, infodemic response, and community engagement uh, in humanitarian settings. She currently works at Internews, strengthening information ecosystem to respond better to health misinformation. Her research interests uh, lay in the, at the intersection between trust and health emergencies, feedback response of humanitarian programming, and the role of local media in public health emergencies. She has previously worked for the World Health Organization, Ground Truth Solution, and um, in several media outlets. She holds a master's degree in global studies and a double degree, uh, bachelor's and master's in journalism and media studies. Welcome on stage, Dr. Ursio Lopez. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, great. Uh, and you can see my screen, right? Hi, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. This is the first slide of your presentation. Yeah. Okay, I, I cannot hear you. Well, I will start. Um, so I'm Rocio Lopez Inigo. Um, I'm, yes, as mentioned, I'm, I'm one of the co authors of this research, which focuses on inequity driven mistrust, its impact to infodemic management, and what to do about it. Um, so this research argues that inequity is a significant, uh, but uh, often overlooked driver of trust in health information, and that a failure to acknowledge and mitigate the effects of deep-rooted inequities can seriously hinder the efficacy of, of humanitarian and health responses and contribute farther to, to the spread of misinformation. Uh, this is a research that, that was developed um, within the framework of the Routine Trust Project, which is a global uh, information response from internews uh, that emerged in mid-2020 in the middle of the of the pandemic, and that was uh, looking to, to identify the, the, the roots of, of misinformation and how to, to address it in uh, among different uh, communities, all, all affected by, by humanitarian crisis. Um, so how did we arrive to this? Uh, well, throughout the project, we attempted at understanding uh, the important uh, drivers of, of trust and information and its impact on misinformation spreading. And we started looking at all the rumor data that we had uh, within our uh, data sets. Um, and it became increasingly apparent and, and uh, clear that there were like the issues of frustration and, and, and over perceived inequity, which were an important factor to, to drive misinformation. Uh, and these were many instances expressed um, mistrust on responders, on the guidance provided, on, on intentions also, and ultimately also uh, on, on further spread on, on misinformation. So we posed the following questions to try to understand a bit better how this inequity-driven mistrust was uh, was affecting um, uh, misinformation spreading and infodemic management. Uh, we wanted to understand how does inequity drive mistrust, how does this impact humanitarian and health response, and ultimately what can be done to acknowledge, to mitigate and address uh, inequity. So in terms of the methodology, just very quickly, uh, we conducted a qualitative data collection with participatory systematic uh, coding based on trends uh, found in our rumor data. Uh, these were from, from different countries uh, in Iraq, in Colombia, Brazil, and Sudan. We after conducted uh, um, qualitative uh, interviews in Iraq and Colombia, more specifically among uh, information ecosystem stakeholders from IDP communities in Erbil, uh, in Iraq, and also in a, among indigenous communities in the in the Amazons in Colombia, and ultimately we we conducted a participatory thematic coding uh, using the the DUS, um, software. Um, what we found, like the overall um, findings, can be summarized in this in this graph. Uh, we have drivers on how does inequity uh, drive mistrust. Then we identify the impacts, uh, and finally rec the recommendations. But now I'm going to go uh, like um, more closely into one of these uh, sections. So in terms of the drivers, uh, we found three different types of drivers. First of all, structural grievances, so uh, that ultimately affect uh, the, the mistrust. Um, 
on responders and the information provided. Also, we found how mis, uh, how inequities in the in health response practices affect uh, also and, and impact mistrust, and also how inequities in information practices during and before emergencies also impact the mistrust place on, on misinformation. Uh, on the first driver, um, yeah, we identified how mistrust emerging from historical and ongoing inequities beyond the emergency impacted the mistrust, uh, the trust in the information. So first of all, of all, we talk about historical marginalization and how it historically fractured relationships between community and actors at different levels fuels mistrust. Um, then uh, we identified how a history of unequal access to quality health care and services fuels mistrust in authorities, in hospitals, in health and professionals. Then as driver number two, we identified how mistrust emerging during the design and implementation of health and humanitarian responses ultimately impacted also the, the trust place on, on these actors. Uh, so this comes a lot from uh, top-down uh, approaches to the response, so uh, a lack of uh, participatory approaches to, to the design of, of, um, of humanitarian responses. Um, also an unwillingness, uh, unwillingness to listen, limiting uh, two-way dialogues and response to feedback, leading also to the contextualized re responses during the, during the emergency. And finally, uh, we identified how the lack of presence of humanitarian actors, health system actors, or if we are mentioning um, in terms of health, also uh, impacts the trust that, that community is a uh, place on on them and that we will see has an impact on the on the trust on the information and the further spread of misinformation and finally we identified how the mistrust emerging from unequal information ecosystem practices impacts also uh, uh trust um sorry yeah yeah sorry um so there's a lack of access uh yeah, there's a mistrust that comes from inequity in the lack of access to relevant information. So it's not just about the availability of factual information, uh, but actually the relevance of that information. So we found that that communities a lot of time uh, mistrust uh, the information uh, when when they receive um, information uh, that is not factual, that is not localized, that is extremely prescriptive, meaning that it doesn't acknowledge their agency, that it's not in their language, that it's not actionable, so it doesn't provide like a, a way forward uh, or, or, or potential options uh, um, to take action within their possibilities and also when the information is not transparent. Uh, and there's also a mistrust uh, that emerge from the unequal production and dissemination. So when there is a lack of uh, transparency in data collection practices, lack of involvement in the production of information, uh, or a, a lack of... Late? Sorry? Two minutes late. It's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I have, two minutes. I have two minutes more, or I'm two minutes yeah, over? Yeah, two minutes I... the end. Yeah, it's because, because of our... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. So then we have the impacts. So it's um, in terms of the impacts, we we can identify um, how all these mistrust um, um, impacts the, the the health and and humanitarian response. Um, so first of all, we identified a, a le different levels of engagement with information, uh, impacts in health and humanitarian outcomes and, and impacts in the specific response. In terms of impacts on the engagement with information, uh, here we found like a seemingly like opposite uh, phenomenon, which is interesting uh, because uh, this mistrust uh, led a lot of times to either a very active engagement with rumors and misinformation as communities were expressing legitimate doubts and questions um, about the, the situation that could transform into very high risk misinformation, but this also gave the space and way for narratives and emotions um, stemming from this mistrust uh, to be used by these information providers to increase traction on their campaigns. And then we also found the uh, completely the opposite, which is the uh, uh, acute disengagement from the from the response and from the information provided. So when basic needs were not met, or like health services or basic uh, services met are not uh, are not met, official information and recommendations seem to lose importance and relevance for communities, affect 
affected by by um, crisis and, and violence, and they can result in active disengagement from official sources, turning into other less uh, trustworthy ones. Um, in terms of impacts on health outcomes, we found an unwillingness to follow health recommendations, which is also very connected to the previous one, and also an exacerbated um, uh, inequity and isolation, meaning that the, the relationship between communities and healthcare providers or humanitarian responders, authorities, uh, is, is uh, increasingly fractured, and that le leads to longer, uh, long-term uh, irreversible damage as trust is broken and therefore more difficult to, to bring in the, the adequate uh, information to communities or to have the dialogue. And finally, we have the third impact that we identified, uh, which is uh, more on the humanitarian response, as there's increased frustration with uh, humanitarian actors and these broken rel relationships uh, affect um, their the, the possibility for dialogue and collaboration, uh, influenced many times by uh, the timeliness and sustainability of the response, changes in services provided, or abrupt a withdrawal from, from uh, services provision. So this is up to here for our um, main results. Obviously, we invite you to check the, the report where we also have some recommendations that are going in line with this, and also get in touch if you if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Rocio. Uh, dear participants, mm -hmm. please submit your questions in the chat and I will ask them at the end of, the, of our presentation period. Uh, very comprehensive and interesting uh, research. Mm -hmm. So our next speaker is Dr. Cecilia Kindelan. She is PhD in communication, she has a degree in journalism and in law. She is master in corporate communication and another master in communication and art. Currently, she is a professor in business ethics at um, ISIC, Marketing Business School. Uh, Cecilia Kindelan is an academic of the Royal European Academy of Doctors. Uh, and uh, previously, she held the position of associate director of I, uh, I, um, e, uh, S, e, business school. She was also a deputy director of the Spanish Association of Directors and the communication manager of the University uh, Universia, Santander Group. So international experience has been mainly in Canada, uh, St. Paul University and Ecuador, uh, SEK uh, International University. So Dr. Kindelan is a firm, firm believer of the power of the education to build better society. So Dr. Cecilia Kindelan, the disinformation and misinformation about global warming in university students. Uh, please take it. Yeah, I'm here and trying to share my screen. Okay, so we hear you, but don't see your yeah. Can you hear me? And now can you see my PowerPoint, my presentation? You, we hear you, but don't see your presentation, unfortunately. Uh, by okay. The, by the okay, I'm trying. I'm trying to, uh, let me see, share screen. Okay. And then now? Yeah, maybe our technical uh, team will start. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why. Um, OK. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, so let me, let me, mm, yeah, because this platform is quite new for me. But OK, you have my presentation? Yeah, you see your presentation. And, yeah. Yes. So maybe yeah. you can help me. Yeah. Okay, because I'm trying to share, but I don't know. Let me let me one moment. Uh, let me see. Um, okay, no, I cannot. Okay, so I'm going to start. So um, first of all, thank you, uh, Olga. Thank you, all the team of the University Carlos III de Madrid, uh, who is in chair of this Congress. So it is a honor uh, to me sharing this uh, research. So I'm going to explain to you in a very, very, very brief way what is the main purpose of this research. So maybe, Olga, can you move uh, to the next slide? 
Ah, or maybe I can do it. I don't know if I can do it. No, I cannot. So, my my resort. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a different thing because until this moment we have been um, hearing and uh, everything talk about misinformation, disinformation about uh, Russia, but uh, and about warm and I'm focused on a different topic. I'm focusing on climate change. Okay, so and I. Yes, I'm going to start with the introduction, a very, very brief introduction, and I'm going to focus on three different concepts. Okay, you can move a little bit more because in this presentation I have more slide, but I would like to summarize it. So I'm going to talk about, yes, yes, stop, stop it. So we are going to talk about climate change. Okay, you know that this is a very, very big and complex problem okay not only because of the different causes uh, it's because of the effects that the effects are not immediately so uh, the effects are medium and long term so for this reason some industry that are affected because of this change, because of the climate change, uh, they would like to avoid losing money, for example, the oil industry and the coal industry, and they start to develop different techniques and tactics in order to manipulate and in order to influence society. Okay, and my question, my main hypothesis was, Maybe one part of the society can be uh, affected or can be manipulated, but what happened with the other? Imagine that we are talking about a um, student, we are talking about university students, and uh, what do you think? Maybe they will be manipulated by this lobby or maybe not. My hypothesis was maybe not because they are a uh, study, they have a lot of information, they have a lot of knowledge, but the result of my study was completely the opposite. So it uh, was unexpected. And um, uh, in order to go deeper to this research, I would like to explain you three different concepts. Uncertainly, why this is important? It's important because, um, okay, there are a lot of information and sometimes it can be contradictory and people based on that in order to think, oh, maybe we don't know all the information. So, and uh, some countries, imagine that we have different agreement, different countries allows that they have to do different things in order to fight against climate change, but not all of them signed different agreements. So there are some resistant in order to believe that the human activity caused this problem. So, and on the other side, we have the media. We have a lot of a confrontation between the media, different message. Maybe it can be very discontinuous. Sometimes is. Uh, Talking, they are talking about tsunamis, uh, they are talking about floods, but we don't know what are the main causes and we don't know how to explain, to transmit this information. And in this specific moment, the lobbyists, the um, uh, PR agencies, take a very big uh, advantage of this situation in order to put all the technique and tactics in order to change your point of view. So, Olga, can you move to another slide? Because now I would like to explain you the other a concept that is, yes, okay, that's perfect. So, we know that the climate change is discovered by scientists, but it's analyzed by experts and it's negotiated by governments elected by citizens. So to save the planet, it is necessary to motivate a change in people's behavior. And this is not easy. And when you put more information or some kind of uh, creating the doubt, I remember um, Felipe Nunez was talking about propaganda and was talking about doubt and this is the same situation. First of all, where the tobacco company who started with these techniques after moved to climate change. And now we are exploring and we are saying the same uh, tactics again in the war in the Ukraine and Israel um, environment. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So this was the third uh, concept, the consensus. Of course that there are consensus, but what happened in science, we don't have 
the 100 percent because it's impossible so and one point that can show that there is consensus consensus in the community in the scientific community is that in 2007 the um, IPCC won the Nobel Prize in order to their research on the human origins of the climate change so everybody was um agree so that the the human act activity caused the climate change but on the other side the media the press the lobbyist this industry manipulation was uh, sending a uh, different yes. information I'm sorry, two minutes uh, left. okay okay thank you thank you olga can you move a little bit um yes manipulation is the other concept that it's very very important because we as we have been talking about the lobbies lobbies use this in order to change the perspective so we can pass to the other please yes as i said okay perfect manipulation so a little bit more because this is more or less the same a little bit, bit more so i would like to can you go back a little bit um, okay, I would like to, yes, here, I would like to talk to you about Naomi Oresket. She was the first lady who discovered that the tobacco industry techniques were um, spread through these new people, so these climate change lobbyists. So, and I would like to show you this, this, this lady. So, please, can we go? So, more, more, a little bit more to the conclusion, because if not, Yes, to the conclusion, to the to the last, last, last. Yes, uh, here, for example, can you? Yes, perfect. Okay, you can stop it here. So, um, what discovered? So, we discovered that if we like to, uh, can you go back to to a slide back, please? Uh, one more. One more. Okay. Okay. No. No. Uh, to, uh, okay. One more. One more forward yes perfect so at the end of our research we discovered that the student who were studying careers in which they were talking and study climate change for example a uh, marine science or different science they the 15 percent they said that they have some doubts in order to um, affirm that the climate change is provoked by human actions. So more or less at the end of our research, that this another slide in which you can show the different percent, I don't know where it is, but uh, okay, maybe go a little bit more. Okay, go, go back, go back. Okay, perfect. So here, here it's important because uh, in order to share this information with uh, our students, so we have to give them information, but not all information. We have to share critical view, critical uh, perspective, because if not, they have a lot of accumulation of data and science, but they don't know how to uh, differentiate what is right and what is not. For this reason, you have to give them evidence all knowledge based on evidence and in critical thinking and of course you have to address some common misinformation argument for example this one climate change is not real okay you have to have more evidence uh, in order to uh, convince them and to um, have a clear vision of what is the reality so for uh, my conclusion is that after 30 years a student climate change after 100 near 100 percent of the community all the scientists agreeing that climate change is caused by uh, human activity we discovered that our student uh, students that are focused on science uh, they are not um, agree 100 percent in this so there is a lot of misinformation and disinformation provoked by this industry this lobby so uh, our mission as professor has to give them critical thinking and try to uh, help them to differentiate yes yes i'm finished i'm finished this is my last idea okay thank you so oh. much for this yeah for this, uh, thank you i'm so sorry about the video yeah, I I don't that we don't have um, more time, but I hope, I really believe that uh, um, we have a chance uh, um, to
to, uh, to contact uh, via email and uh, to familiarize with the research itself uh, because it's really interesting and important uh, for you know, our next, next generation. Then okay, thank you. Brilliant, Bye. Brilliant insight. Yeah. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jose Manuel Marcos Vilche. Uh, he is a research and teaching assistant in the Department of Communication and Education at Universidad Loyola Andalusia. In Spain, he is a PhD student in the doctoral program uh, in psychology at the same institution, and he has been working on several European research projects such as spotted and fake spotting related to his doctoral thesis at the speaking training proposal to promote media and informational literacy and critical thinking to combat disinformation. So, meet Dr. Jose Manuel Marcos Vilches uh, uh, with the important study conducted by him with his colleagues Jose Antonio Muniz Velasquez and Milagrosa Sanchez Martin. The topic is effectiveness of training actions aimed at improving critical thinking in the face of disinformation. Jose, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you so much, Olga, for these brief uh, introductions and um, for moderating this section. Uh, of course, thanks to Universidad Carlos III and the rest of the uh, fake, uh, Stop Fake and the rest of partners for organizing this Congress. And of course, thanks to all the participants for sharing their relevant uh, research results with us. I'm going to share my presentation, okay? Okay, one moment, please. Oh, maybe let you uh, let our technical team to help. We have the presentation. No. Can you can you see my presentation? Yeah, we see it. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, I'm going to start the presentation on behalf of all the other uh, authors of this uh, project, uh, Jose Antonio Muñiz Velázquez and Milagrosa Sánchez Martín from Universidad Loyola Andalucía. I'm going to be in charge to explain you what are the more important aspect or details of these uh, papers or research. Effectiveness of training actions aim at improving critical thinking in the face of disinformation, a systematic review. This is the table of contents. Uh, I'm going to try to talk about every, every point. But first of all, I would like to share with us a brief contextualization because I think it's the best way to understand better what is the real purpose of this systematic review. As discussed in previous presentation and the uh, conference opening, disinformation is one of the most relevant challenge uh, we uh, affect uh, or we attend today, uh, affecting all areas and um, fields of our society. The worst consequences of disinformation include um, the threat uh, uh, to people's a right or freedom to access accurate information, um, the undermining of our democracies. So many international organizations, such as European Commission, European Union through European Commission and uh, the UNESCO, for instance, have um, point out the importance uh, to find uh, educational solutions to. Uh, empower citizens to detect uh, um, information disorders, disinformation in general, uh, through information, media, and digital uh, literacy skills. And also um, emphasizing in the um, promotion of critical thinking in the face of disinformation. But what is critical thinking? Critical thinking is a very complex and controversial construct because it's a multidimensional nature and because there is a, a large variety of, um, of views that try to address it. 
Uh, however, uh, one of the most accomplished uh, interpretations so far is the Peter's, um, Peter's Fashionist uh, definitions in 1990s. Uh, in which uh, critical thinking is considered a self-regulated judgment. Well, um, consequently, uh, several experts uh, have uh, highlighted the potential that instructions has uh, in the flourishing of critical thinking in the face of disinformation. But uh, this linkage needs to be proven. So we believe that the first step is to note what have been done uh, in this respect. Um, maybe the best option or the best way to achieve this purpose is a systematic review. It's true that um, in the literature we find a different uh, systematic review about um, critical thinking training, but to our knowledge, no systematic review has investigated exclusively the effect of training actions on improving critical thinking in the face of disinformation. So we believe this is a research gap. Uh, so I think we think this uh, needed to, to, to have a solution for this research gap. So we, we want to, to conduct a systematic review. Uh, the main objective of the systematic review is to examine the effectiveness of training actions oriented to improve critical thinking in the face of disinformation, especially those presented under an instructional intervention design and aimed at adults of legal age, regardless of gender, origin, or professional profile. Well, to achieve this purpose, we set out three specific research goals. The first one is to identify and compile the available evidence on training actions to improve critical thinking in the face of disinformation. The second one is systematize the key elements of training actions. And the third one is quantify and evaluate the results of training actions to improve critical thinking in the face of disinformation. Finally, we propose an additional fourth objective to carry out a meta-analysis only if adequate quantificable resources are obtained in the, um, in the systematic review before. As a methodological level, we have used different resources for conduct uh, effective systematic reviews, such as the Prisma Statement, Cochrane's Collaboration Resources, or the PICOS model or strategy for establishing or to establish the legibility criteria, uh, design a previous protocol studies for this systematic review, and also to design a search and a study selection strategy. This is, these are the, the legibility criteria uh, responding to the PICOS strategy, participants and populations, what type uh, of interventions, comparators, outcomes, study designs, and also we have uh, included another relevant items such as type of scientific publication, languages, settings, or time period. It's also important to take into account that the search um, strategy uh, has been conducted in or carry out in 12 electronic database, Web of Science, Scopus, Education Resource Information Center, Communication Source, etc. Um, its uh, search terms and strings uh, have uh, been um, uh, established according to the PICOS strategy and also has been piloted in the WAS and Scopus uh, database. In this table, we can see all the um, all the keywords with all the synonyms about the the important or the the the, um, the several points of our uh, search strategy. Well, about the preliminary result, uh, nine thousand eight hundred and thirty studies for uh, the total search results, but only seventeen studies for the definite selections or the final uh, sample after a blended pair review process uh, that is summarized in this flow dry diagram uh, according to oh. the PRISMA guidelines. Sorry, we have two minutes left. Okay, thank you so much. About the publication, the studies were published between 2007 and 2023. 2022 is the year with the most publication, a total of seven studies, 
All the studies have been written in English and disseminated as a scientific articles in high impact journals. And the USA is the country in which most studies have been conducted. Um, about the interventions, the majority of the training, uh, the training actions are instructional interventions, but we have uh, also found two psychological interventions uh, conducted through a cognitive inoculation strategy. The majority of these interventions uh, uh, present, is, uh, present with a quasi-experimental design and a true experimental design too. The, these are uh, some of the most important characteristics of the participation of the studies. The total participations are 517 nine participants and another important characteristic is that for example the majority are women are women and also higher education students focus on communication and psychology studies about the purpose is uh, so important to take into account that only for a study explicitly pursue the promotion and improvement uh, of the critical thinking in the context of combating disinformation or were proposed and the rest of the study pursue other objectives. For example, to determine the impact of media and information literacy skills, determine the value of serious games or other specific objectives. So finally, according to these preliminary results, we conclude the following. The GRs and characteristic of this publication analy analysis coincide with when this information became a challenge leading to increased scientific production. However, despite this scientific proliferation, we'll still find few intervention studies that explicitly aim to improve critical thinking in the face of this information. It's worrying about this explicit objective, a large part of these analysis studies takes the improvement of critical thinking for granted after the intervention. So we need to continue working in this um, paper to confirm these conclusions, uh, particularly in a strategy intervention effects, determining measurement instrument usage and assessing the risk of bias of these studies. That's all, this is the references. And um, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Jose, yeah, for your brilliant uh, speaking <laughs> to the panel. Uh, thank you, and uh, yeah, I uh, remind you once again that you can uh, uh, write to the chat, uh, ask the questions in the chat, and we will help for the Q&A session after, the, um, uh, after, after our panel. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. And, uh, and now meet our next speaker, uh, Richard Sell, with an extensive background in complex system engineering and the application of machine learning for data discovery. Richard leads the deployment of Fortanix confidential computing technology for customers. Richard has served as general member's representative to the government, governing board and chair of the End User Advisory Council of the Confidential Computing uh, Consortium uh, of the Linux Foundation, and he is recognized as a thought leader on applications of confidential computing. Richard holds a Doctor of Business Administration from Henry Business School at the University of Reading, and has filed patent, patents and published published papers on the application of confidential computing technology and is researching the use of artificial intelligence system uh, within the context of national security. So, Dr. Richard Hill, um, so, for Phoenix, uh, countering disinformation in an age of magical realism and suspended disbelief. You have the floor. Thank you, Olga. Let me uh, share my screen. Could you uh, make, a bit, make it a bit louder? Um, is that better? Yeah. Great. Uh, hopefully you can uh, see my screen. Um, so good, yeah, good evening. Yeah. So good evening, everybody. Um, thank you to Olga for chairing this session. And also I'd like to extend my thanks to the, the organizers of what is an important uh, Congress, um, as we've heard, you know, disinformation is one of the, the, the major challenges that's facing society at the moment. And in this presentation, what I'm going to do is present um, some preliminary thoughts on a technical uh, solution in order to support the countering of disinformation. 
um, in what I've termed a, an age of magical realism and, and suspended disbelief. So this has been brought about um, following the emergence of generative AI, um, which has become synonymous with large language models such as ChatGPT, but actually has much broader capabilities. And these uh, massive uh, AI models uh, contain now multimodal generative capabilities, and that means that they can uh, generate outputs on the basis of images, text, audio inputs and outputs, and, and combinations uh, of, of all of those different uh, modalities. And importantly, there are public APIs and open source foundational models that now present very low barriers to adoption uh, and the use of these technologies for this information. Uh, especially uh, for state actors that might want to proliferate uh, this information and generate false content. And as models are scaling towards uh, greater than one trillion uh, parameters, this is enhancing the output fidelity of the models uh, and is uh, effectively constraining the ability of, of humans to discern synthetic information or disinformation uh, in the content that's being produced. And we'll see some examples of that in a second. So this is uh, something that is akin to um, what could be termed magical realism, where the information domain is proliferated by um, half-truths and uh, information that's based on fact, but is actually false in, in its narrative or, or the context in which it's being delivered. And we can... Uh, uh, refer back to the original thoughts uh, around magical realism where um, generated fictions are, are woven with facts uh, and this effectively is, is the domain in which people are now receiving their information and requires a new techno-social contract. And an example of this which was uh, published in March of this year is the Balenciaga Pope uh, and what's interesting about this is that Forbes commented that the speed at which the image spread, along with the credulity of some media users, has sparked concerns that the public's not ready for this incoming wave of misinformation threatened by the rise of generative AI. And effectively, the suspension of disbelief in the receipt of information and, as we've heard, the informal uh, communication channels with it, within which disinformation can be spread uh, is giving rise to you know, a, a significant concern, uh, particularly ahead of uh, election years uh, around the world in 2024. So the Pope uh, image is a fairly trivial example, but there are also examples um, just after that image was published. Um, there was a series of images from the same source using the mid-journey tool that effectively showed how the moon landings might have been staged. And this is obviously a popular conspiracy that um, many people still subscribe to. But secondarily, just recently, there was the use of deepfake audio um, to represent the uh, or misrepresent the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, around uh, Armistice Day celebrations on Remembrance Weekend in the United Kingdom. And what's important here is that this information was uh, circulated and amplified on social media by far right groups. But within the space of hours, it had been determined um, by the authorities in the United Kingdom that that deep fake audio did not in itself constitute a criminal offence. And so this uh, presents the, the issue of how to control information when uh, the threshold of criminality is not necessarily met within the law. So within the research that um, is being undertaken in this area, there are several requirements that, for a control of information. And the criteria are really around providing uh, attribution, authentication, provenance, and verification of the information, and then to provide some mode of qualification for the users in order, to, as we heard in the previous presentation, to support the uh, act of critical thinking. But there are also some significant challenges here. First of all, can the identity of the originator actually be determined, whether that be a, a human creator uh, generating a prompt, for example, or a machine in terms of a bot that's actually generating images and then uh, distributing them? In terms of authentication, uh, the trustworthiness of claims made uh, with respect to the identity of the individual concerned or the, the source origin of the material is, is very important and problematic. And then in terms of the uh, history of that artifact, um, how reliable is its provenance? Has 
um, previously reliable information be misappropriated or positioned out of context in order to generate a false narrative. And here we come to the thorny question of what are the truth givers to information and how can they be um, discerned as uh, reliable in the context of consumption of the information within informal or formal channels for that matter? And what methods uh, can actually be used that are able to provide users with um, some necessary uh, background to the information they're receiving uh, at the speed of relevance that's demanded in today's society? So there are some foundational tools that are available here, and in particular, um, the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity has generated an open standard for uh, metadata tagging of information. But these uh, tools and limitations, are, uh, these tools actually have their own limitations. So in the context of that open standard, C2PA, as it's referred to, defines the provenance of artifacts but it doesn't, uh, it's not able to make any claims in terms of the truthfulness of that content. I'm sorry, we have about two minutes left. Um, talk, thank sorry. you. Yeah, thank you. And we uh, <clears throat> have sophisticated technologies for digital watermarking, but just recently a paper has been published that has found those methods to be vulnerable through the course of generative AI. Um, we have examples of data confidence fabrics and identity trust fabrics. But those identities need to both be both self-sovereign and conditional. There needs to be some uh, basis of fact that is uh, independently verifiable. And in terms of vectorization and embeddings, uh, which is uh, the way that uh, information is encoded within generative AI systems, similarity searches are computationally intensive and themselves non-deterministic. They're probabilistic in their uh, determination. And this presents a problem in terms of accuracy of uh, validity and also the uh, speed of relevance. So this final slide presents uh, the preliminary architecture that's being discussed in this uh, context, where um, the verification of identity claims, information claims, and provenance claims about that information need to be brought together in what you might refer to as an information trust fabric. And there are several issues here that need to be uh, addressed in terms of uh, further research. The first is the basis of trust for identity verification through some independent trust authority. Uh, and this might be um, done cryptographically or via decentralized uh, techniques that are being explored with self-sovereign identity. And also revision control for provenance in terms of ensuring that that provenance and that history of the information and the context to which it refers is consistent and, and can't be um, disjoint uh, where people use information and create a, a new chain for that particular artifact. So in terms of verifying the information claims to control this information, uh, the thesis or the, the hypothesis here is that the counterfactual generation from the um, asserted claims can be compared through both multimodal search and uh, generative AI, which is not only the potential source of the problem, but also potentially a component of the solution here to generate some conditional uh, measure of veracity, uh, which in itself would be probabilistic, but that can then be normalized within the context of other information that um, refers to those claims, uh, or for example, a, a location in which information is said to be uh, set and this enables not only the development of an information trust score to support an information trust fabric, which the, the user can use as a, a measure of the dependability of the information, but also uh, generative AI can use the contextual embeddings and that measure of veracity to generate user guidance so that when information is consumed, warnings and uh, advisories can be provided to support that process of critical thinking. So this is a list of the references uh, associated with the presentation. And uh, thank you for listening today. And I, I welcome any comments via my uh, contact details there. OK. Thank you so much, Dr. Stell. Uh, and yeah, it's a really impressive solution. <laughs> I, I will have the questions uh, later. And yeah, I remind you to submit your questions in the chat. And now I'm happy to introduce to you our last by not, but not least speaker. Dr. Pablo Hidalgo Cobo. He is Associate Professor at the Rey Juan Carlos University, Visiting Professor at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. 
she is a doctor, she is a doctoral candidate in communication at the Ray Juan Carlos University, uh, researching about fact checking regarding Russian aggression in Ukraine. She has a master's degree in advanced European and international studies at the Centre International uh, de Formation European, just mentioned for academic results. So, fighting against disinformation in Europe, the case of fact checkers agency. The study conducted by Pablo Hidalgo and his colleagues. Uh, Cassandra Lopez, PhD in communication, and Belen Puebla, PhD in communication science, um, uh, in Universidad Rey Juan Carlos. Please, Pablo, the floor is yours. We see your presentation. Sorry, Pablo, but we cannot hear you. Yeah, for some reason we don't hear Pablo. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Hello. Okay, I'm sorry. So I was just saying thank you very much, Ola, for the presentation and um, Thank you very much as well, um, the university for the organization and of course, all the previous uh, presentations that were so interesting. So, uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, we see it, we see the first Okay, slide. okay, so, um, yes, as Ola said, the title of uh, our presentation is Fighting Against Disinformation in Europe, the case of Fact Checkers Agency. So, um, the, I've been listening to all the, your presentations, all of them were very interesting, and uh, I'm going to try not to repeat some of the things you already said. So I have, we have quite a lot of data, so I think it's interesting if I can uh, show you this, this data, so I will try to go straight to the point. So basically, um, what we are interested here is about the international uh, scope of the disinformation that, as you all know, and in this Congress we can see perfectly, there is a very strong link between uh, disinformation, geopolitics, uh, war, and um, even um, an international issue, right? So, uh, from this point of view, um, we design a descriptive uh, methodology, so we just want to show our results, our, what we found, but uh, we do not work with hypotheses. We just want to describe what we see, and we did a quantitative approach. So, as I told you before, uh, we have quite uh, a lot of that. So what we did is uh, content analysis, that is um, one of the best methodologies to approach this kind of content, and the unit of analysis was, was the post of the different fact checkers. So I think here you can see it much better. These are the um, 14 uh, fact checkers we choose. So you all know the International Fact Checker Network. So uh, we took every agency from uh, this International Fact Checker Network in Spain, France, and the UK. Um, in France, there are three fact checkers that we exclude them uh, because different reasons, but uh, they were not um, suitable to, to this quantitative analysis. So what we did is analyze uh, one by one the 771 posts of this um, 14 fact checkers. So we can see that we have around almost 300 posts in Spain and in the UK and uh, 200 in France. So um, I will show you the results of the whole sample. So the 771, so we can have an idea of uh, the European, let's say, or at least these three countries uh, approach. Then we will focus in the difference uh, among countries and we will focus in agency one by one. So, since the sample is different for countries, in the case I compare countries, I will use it. Uh, I will use relative terms. Okay, so uh, we can compare them without uh, any limitation. What we study of each of these posts, uh, it was the agency, of course. The scope can be international, national, or regional. The countries uh, they mention, and any other minority institution they they mention. So, for example, European Union, or um, World Economic Forum, uh, any institution or any minority groups. Sometimes they talk about uh, Muslims or um, about uh, um, Europeans, for example. So this kind of, of terms, we talk them as well. 
So I want to show you the, the results we found. So uh, the most uh, generic one is this one. If we take the 771, we see that almost half are international. Here I have to clarify something very important, that is that our criteria for international is uh, when in the post we find anything, anything related to another country. So the name of the country, the name for, of a politician of the country, or the name of a company or something of the country. So it's a very broad criteria. So that's the reason um, there is a, a different criteria than the one uh, we use in journalism when we say a news international. Okay, this this criteria is it's broader. Okay, so this is according to the objective of the investigation of the research. So the first point here is that we see kind of balance uh, between international verifications and national ones. If we see the countries, the most uh, most mentioned, this is uh, interesting. Uh, it was the sample was at the month of July. So we have to remember that uh, there was the death of uh, this young French uh, immigrant uh, by the police um, and there was a lot of riots. So most of these um, mention of France are related to, to this uh, topic. Then we have India and United States, of course, Ukraine and, and Russia. And then you have all the others with just a few mention. It's interesting because if, if you remember, of course you do, uh, last July we have in Spain elections. So in an event with a general election in Spain in July, the French and UK fact checkers only talk about Spain six times. So it's very little. Um, here is the same data than before, but we just uh, put them by groups. So we see that these three European fact checkers, the international uh, fact checking they are doing, is mostly in Europe, and here we separate Russia and Ukraine because, uh, of course, there is different situation. But at the end, there are European countries. They they, they count like uh, half of the of the sum of the international sum. Okay. Um, I don't know how am I doing with the time, Olga. Yeah, you have a bit more than two minutes now. Okay, perfect. So here, this is, I think this is the, the interesting part. So if you look at this chart, what, what we did is um, we took Spain fact checkers, France fact checkers, and UK fa uh, fact checkers, and um, we, we count how many international posts they have, how many national, regional, that it means from Catalonia, uh, Scotland, or Northern Ireland, because in Spain and UK, and UK there are fact checkers that they are focused on one region only. And then general, when they don't say anything like, for example, general would be like, is it climate change real? That would be uh, general because uh, there is nothing uh, national or international or regional, okay? So the interesting point here is that we see that uh, UK, the fact checkers from UK are the most international focus by far. And we see that um, the Spanish one are the ones with more uh, national focus, uh, also with France. And it's also interesting to see that in France there is no regional um, agencies or, or fact checking. Uh, since this is related, of course, uh, with the nature of, of of these three countries. And then this is very interesting as well because uh, we see all these three countries again, but by regions. So we see that, for example, Spain is the country where the fact checkers are talking more about Europe and about Latin America. Okay. Um, if we go to France, I sorry, uh, this is uh, UK. Sorry. If we go to UK, they talk more about Asia. This is basically um, India, and they talk more about the USA and North America. And uh, France, they talk more about Africa, about the uh, Russian train, and about Middle East. So it makes sense with the colonial past of these uh, three countries. Broadly, this is a, a, a some of the conclusion we can draw, right? And then if we go, if we check which countries uh, were mentioned in each country, of course, they, when they mention Spain, the Spanish fact checkers, it's not uh, international and uh, it's not mentioned in Spain. We, we don't consider that, of course. So in Spain, uh, there is a lot of um, protagonists of France and then just a little bit of uh, USA and then Germany and Morocco just with four. Um, if we go with uh, to France, we see there is uh, like uh, more balance and they have like 13 for the usa uh, 11 in ukraine uh, nine in russia seven in niger, niger that we had all this coup d'etat as well 
Uh, um, lastly, UK, we see a very strong focus on India that we will see later why it is. Okay, and they talk a lot also about France and about USA and last about Ukraine. Okay, this is the top four of each country. Well, uh, of course, there are more more data. Um, and this last chart, I think, is very interesting as well, because here you can see by order uh, the, the the percentage of international uh, fact checkings by fact checker. So here we see very very clearly that there. Are three fact checkers that they have above 80 percent of international fact checking this is uh, les observateurs uh, france 24 logically from the uk and 20 minutes a uh, uh, fake off fake off of france as well but this is the sample was very small they only the whole the whole month they only did like uh, 10 verification i think something like that okay then we have as well these three two of them are from uk and the other one is from spain um uh, fact for it, uh, North Island has the focus on North Island. All the all the fact checking is is uh, about North Island. For it, fact ser service is focused on Scotland. And Verifica is more balanced, but they have a lot of uh, fact checking about Catalan. Then here we have all this group of these uh, five fact checkers that they have uh, quite a balance uh, between international and national focus, right? Uh, here we have Verifica from Spain, Neutral from Spain, uh, the British Full Fact, uh, and the French. Uh, and Le I'm Le sorry, the time is over. <laughs> let's let, let just make it finish. Okay, so I'm done. I'm just uh, just the conclusion I told you already, but just that are different uh, between the agencies uh, according to the geographical scope. These are the countries with most mention, and then we see difference uh, between Spain, France, and UK with Spain more nationally focused and more focused on Latin America and Europe, France uh, with a lot of um, fact checkers agencies and more focused on African countries and Russia and Ukraine, and UK with um, one national, one international and two regional. And that's it. Thank you very much and uh, sorry for the, for the time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Pablo Hidalgo. Uh, it's really like interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Thank you. And now, finally, we have uh, some <laughs> some time uh, for a, a Q and A session. Um, I don't see question on the chat, and also on YouTube, there are no questions. Maybe. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, please, Bernardo. Um, hello, uh, thank you for this very interesting uh, first day. Um, about uh, Pablo uh, Hidalgo's presentation just now, um, I had, uh, first of all, let me give you a, a, a really a big applause for this study. And um, if you can share, it uh, would be great. Um, how did you actually split uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian information from Russian information? That was my question. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, but uh, actually, we were not uh, differentiating um, uh, the countries um, that for the, the disinformation from the country, but the country that it's mentioned. So in the case Russia was mentioned, we're saying Russia. In the case uh, Ukraine was mentioned, we said Ukraine, and it was a multiple answer. So in some cases, where it was both. So I think we wanted to know um, which which countries were mentioned, and then um, which is the criteria. And at the end, we're analyzing only the the countries that are mentioned on the headline, because otherwise there are many many references, and I think we were losing the the, the point. So that was the the methodology. That's how we did it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, other questions? So, uh, okay. Uh, Daniel, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Olga. I don't have a question, but I have a clarification. And because our first presentation that we had in this last session, uh, we had a misunderstanding with the with the speakers, and I'm talking about the first one that we didn't have the speaker in the room uh, yeah. called "Explanatory Journalism Within European Fact Checking" uh, by Victoria Moreno Gil and colleagues. And we have received the video, the recorded video for this presentation, 
And at the oh, moment, okay. the technical secretariat is uploading the video. So in some few minutes, the video will be uploaded together with the other ones in the program website of the Congress. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And I have another question to um, Richard. The question is about yeah about your uh, comprehensive uh, solution for uh, for the current situation with uh, with this information. So, um, what are main challenges in implementing this solution, and how to overcome them? It's like also a comprehensive question, question, but maybe you um, thought it over. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are many challenges. So I think um, the principal challenge, uh, which I think the, the C2PA standard goes uh, some way towards is in order for any comprehensive technical solution, there needs to be interoperability in order for you to be able to apply it to um, different types of information and information within different contexts. So I think there is a need for global consensus on standards and um, policies uh, around the implementation of, of such an architecture. But, but equally, the, um, the fundamental sort of basis of the research at the moment is to identify technical solutions for each of the different component parts, because, as I mentioned, there are issues, for example, with digital watermarking, where the technology that's used in generative AI can effectively wash out digital watermarks that might be implemented at, at source. And also, as I mentioned with the C2PA standard, the, the issues of provenance <clears throat> are largely understood and there are solutions there, but the, the problem of truth and assertion of truth is, is really a thorny question. And um, I, I can't pretend to have any solutions there, but one of the, the thoughts is that by actually using contextual information that can potentially be sourced by standard um, search methods and also by generative AI, that cross comparison of information can engender some kind of informational trust score based on um, other uh, instances of information relating to the context. So it's an interesting area, but it, it's obviously going to be especially important as this technology develops. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you so much. And uh, uh, yeah, the solution is uh, still better than, <laughs> than challenge, so it's, it's like a way to, 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 to go. So, um, any other questions? If we don't have, um, we, uh, it's time to wrap up our session. It was really fruitful and productive. I am really sorry for the tight schedule, but uh, it means that we had time to um, get some different perspectives. Uh, so thank you, dear panelists, for your time and participation. Thank you, dear participants, for your uh, questions. And uh, we would like to go to the end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Olga. And on behalf of the organizing committee, we close the session for today. And we uh, wait and we will uh, look forward to see you tomorrow in the morning. We start at 9.30 Madrid uh, time. So see you tomorrow for another exciting day where some of us will be in, in presence physically in the campus in Madrid and some others will be online. So thank you for everything today. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.